Okay, so we got to share this, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's go. Let's do that. So, guys, yeah. if you're tuning in, are, are people tuned in now? If you're tuning in now, mm -hmm. maybe maybe you're not. We're just going to share the, the page. Mm -hmm. uh, So many deviations lately, don't you think? You what do you mean? That? Just in the uh, in the group, so many deviations lately. Yeah. I like it. It's uh, more discussion. <laughs> no, I mean I like discussion. There's a difference between discussion and deviation, though. You got to be you got to be careful with that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It has to be founded on facts, as Ma would say. Seek truth from facts. Yeah, no, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's uh, no. I mean, like it's like because you know. Just some of the positions. I mean, I think I think there. You know, I think where, where you always have the difficulty is when you just have people who just have. I mean, I know this maybe is kind of like threadbare as an explanation, but you just have people who just approach these these issues in very very dogmatic ways to make it hard to discuss. I mean, you know, like like I think anyone, as long as they're approaching this, you know, in the right kind of way. Like I've had. Uh, by the way, guys, if you're tuning in now, we're just sharing the group round. We're going to really start in like a minute. But uh, you know, I've had very productive discussions, I think, with people I, I disagree with, like um, Ben Burgess, for example. Mm -hmm. We talked about China. Great discussion, you mm -hmm. know, be because he's, you know, he's a logical guy. And, uh, you know, like he recognizes, I think, you know, like, like, so for example, he supports the nationalization of all kinds of diverse industries, you know, Walmart, sports, whatever. And so yeah. like, even just to say like, well, this is happening in China, or, you know, I think he recognizes the strength of those kind of policies. You know, even if he disagrees with the system in general, so you're able to have a very rich discussion. You know, um, but there has to be, you know, there has to be that willingness to, um, you know, acknowledge that degree of nuance. Certainly, um, there's that word again, nuance. I know. I already look at look at it. I already I already blew, blew our load well this quickly. What do you know? No, but it's true. It's true. Um, here in Mexico, there's a there's a great uh, thing we can talk about where nuance is the key word. Because right now uh, we're having a political struggle mm -hmm. where you have uh, you have a lot of activists, you know, yeah. uh, green activists, ecological activists, who are vying for renewable energy, right? But um, what's really going on is that these are astroturfed, um, you know, um, protesters, right? And they're backing pretty much foreign investment because. We do have renewable energy, and our national grid is expanding its renewable energy um, and giving them the installations more maintenance, you know, so on and so on. But people get duped into thinking that what we're doing is that we're closing the door to, you know, solar power, right? To wind power, right? Because what's really going on is that there are these two major foreign interests, one from Spain another one from further to the east in Europe. And they're both, um, they, they both brokered through um, through payouts, through kickbacks, which are actually, uh, I think this is all uh, very relevant uh, to the text that we're going to read right now. So I'm great that we're talking about this. Um, so what's going on is that we had legislation that, that got passed by our Chamber of Deputies and by our Senate, but this will happen, you know, through corruption, right? Which is, you know, a real problem everywhere. And now you have liberals who are saying, well, we can't go against the law, right? It's in the law. So we should respect that. And they don't care to investigate the nuance behind, you know, it turns out that these legislators uh, did their work, you know, in a, in a self-interest manner, you know, in a corrupt manner. Are we really gonna let that just pass? Is it just law now, right? Yeah, I think yeah, for sure. And I think like I think a lot of it is that you know if you look at what I call deviations, I mean it's also points which you know sort of ideological orientations which um, you know don't seem to uh, to flow from a sincere engagement with the problems at hand, right? So when you're talking about astroturfing, that's a really good example. But I mean that can even mm -hmm. be a lot more discreet, right? Than mm -hmm. that. So. You know, in terms of um, in terms of the group, um, you know, I think when we bring up China, you know, there's a lot of difficulty because I think people are really conditioned to see these problems in a certain way. You know, typically mm -hmm. if they're coming from the West, I found usually people from you know the global South in our group have been less ideological in terms of how they approach that. Um, 
but you know, I think the last thing that would be a good, you know, that would be a good idea for, uh, uh, you know, China to do would be to adhere to the advice of the West in this respect, right? Because, you know, you have, you have these kind of two positions, right? In the West, you have, I'll say quite schematically, right? You have sort of like a, uh, uh, a liberal position, right? You know, China should open, you know, very quickly, you know, just allow limited, you know, foreign investment and so on. Well, this would be an economic catastrophe, right? Were this to happen, not to mention a political cat catastrophe in, in such, in a way like that. Um, yeah. You know, we've talked about foreign rents and all this before. I mean, even Zizek says this about Tiananmen Square, mm -hmm. right? And he says, "Why? Well, you know, it's awful what happened, but I do think it would have been a catastrophe, you know. Um, and then you have, yeah. so that's, that's kind of the liberal critique. But then on the other side, you have kind of the left critique, right? Um, which, you know, tends to be based on a very programmatic and abstract approach to these questions that doesn't take into account, like, the particular realities of third world development, you know, or, um, you know, China's economic situation or things like that, right? So, you know, that's what I mean. It's like, I think, you know, if you're trying to grasp, you know, the Chinese situation, you have to, you have to invest yourself in it. And insofar as we can, and I, I don't think we can purport to be real experts in the subject, uh, insofar yeah, right. as we can kind of ground ourselves in that position and see where they're looking at it from. But, but in terms of insincerity, you know, you get other things too, you know, there's a big, uh, there's a big debate about uh, sort of trans issues that was going on in the group. I don't know if you noticed. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, and, and there were certain people who, you know, were purporting to have a kind of objective view of it. But I think the problem is partly to do with the, U with the fact that the UK has become such a bastion of reaction, um, you know, uh, in this respect, that there's a lot of propaganda disseminated through channels. And, and actually, it's interesting. If you look at the UK, right, support for, for trans rights has dropped 56% uh, to 50% amongst the public in the past two years alone. Right. You know, this is with, you know, J.K. Rowling and all these things going on. Um, so that's a lot of ideology. Right. You know, saturating, you know, this question, particularly in that environment. Um, so this is what I mean. It's like, you know, uh, I think these are all, you know, these kind of ideological influences all prevent people from being able to engage sincerely with these questions. Right. You know, I mean, it must be really sad, especially for the UK. I'm just thinking. Right. Because, for example, here in, in Mexico, when we're trying to think, you know, out of the box, right? Like, mm -hmm. how are we in terms to other countries? We, I mean, not all of us are bilingual, so we just look across the border to other countries that also speak the same language. And <laughs> I can't imagine, you know, having only um, the United States, right, as a, as a, bar as a cultural barometer, right? Jesus. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, well, don't even, yeah, well I mean, I mean, but but I said the problems with, with because I just brought up the trend stuff briefly, mm -hmm. the problems with that in the UK are more specific to the UK. They're not as bad in the United States for a range of mm -hmm. reasons, which you don't want to get into now. Um, but as regards politics in general, yeah, you know, and I've said, like, I think that, you know, it's almost a de facto consequence that if you don't have a certain kind of orientation or investment, you know, in in trying to delve into these problems that, you know, if you come from the English reading, speaking world, just by virtue of, of normalized media exposure and so forth, you're likely to develop a somewhat reactionary worldview, right? Because there's just a barrage of that stuff. It's, it's very much the default, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, definitely. And, and I think I think it's fair to say that, you know, the default differs depending on your social class. I mean, probably amongst, you know, social classes that are more affluent, educated, urban, it's this sort of, you know, um, kind of progressive neoliberalism. Right. Right. You know, and I think there's more populist energies in rural areas and so forth. Um, but but yeah. there's, you know, the, the WEF, the WEF doesn't have actually Richard Wolf. Right. Talked about the, the failure of the uh, which I thought was an interesting video. And he talked about the failure of the uh, the the Amazon, you know, the unionization drive. And he said, look, like, you know, like the problem, it didn't have to do with anything like Amazon had, um, you know, Amazon had uh uh you know the 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 workers they had a fine campaign you know there was no strategic coup de gras on either side um but the u.s environment is just aggressively anti-worker you know and in france and in europe they've had you know unions for a long time right you know with amazon and so forth um and he traces this back to the whole climate of post-war europe right in terms of the strength of communist parties and, and workers organization and this and that um you know so so i think you know it speaks to the acute cultural problem Right. And the tendency to see things, things ideologically. But hey, we should we should get into this now. We should yeah, get, yeah get let's, let's move into the, so into the reading. We are, so. we are here doing Chinese Marxism number 12. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, and today uh, we're just going to take on a few readings. Uh, I think in terms of situating these readings contextually 
Uh, it's important to recognize that. So this is sort of the mid 80s, right about 1986, I think 85 that we're looking at, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we're kind of leading up here to uh, kind of the last uh, leg of Deng's career, uh, which is also defined by, by catastrophe in the form of uh, Tiananmen Square. Um, mm -hmm. And shortly, you know, I, I believe shortly after that, he retires, partly because of the untenability of maintaining a visible position after everything that's transpired. Um, and then you have the, the final um, speeches he gives in favor of uh, continued economic liberalization, <laughs> not his word, continued e economic opening up uh in uh various uh special economic zones um in the early 90s which is where we'll conclude uh next week but this week uh we're, we're going to look at a few uh texts um and let me see here about this the um oops let me pull this up the um the first is uh <clears throat> there is no fundamental contradiction between socialism and a market economy from 1985 the second is an interview with Mike Wallace from 1986, which I like, to be honest, because it's just called Mike Wallace. You know, I think that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and the third is take a clear cut stand against bourgeois liberalization. And the third would be interesting uh, as well, uh, insofar as you can already see that several years before the outbreak of Tiananmen Square, um, you know, Deng has already become acutely aware right, of the problems that have to do with, um, you know, a lack of fidelity to the party and an incapacity to sort of sell. Uh, the changes that had taken hold since 78 um, to an adequate degree to the masses, which I think also attests, to be fair, to some of the inherent structural difficulties, not just the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a that's a factor. And actually, it's interesting after Tiananmen Square happens because, you know, um, Dang putting on sort of like his strongest face, right? One of the things he says is he's like, oh, well, it's inevitable this would have happened in some way, shape or form. You know, I think we weathered it as well as we could have, but this would have happened in any case, right? So I don't know if that's true, but it, but it's interesting, right? He sees, he does see the contradiction, right? That's been opened up, you know, uh, the rift, right? That's taken hold in China, you know, in terms of um, the way that kind of the defeat of the Gang of Four and the end of kind of the Mao cult of personality, right? Created this sort of vacuum, right? You know, that hasn't hasn't been filled. Mm -hmm. Right, ideologically, yeah, and and you know, so that's that's interesting. But uh, should we go into uh, should we go into so the first one is uh, there is no contradiction. Let me just pull this up again. I lost my bookmark, so I have to. That's fine. <clears throat> and by the way, guys, uh, so next week again, I, I also encourage you to tune in next week because next week we'll be um, we'll be doing um, the last session of Deng uh, before we go into Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, there's no fundamental contradiction. That's why I'm not okay. Yeah, there, there, there is no fundamental contradiction between socialism and a market economy. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Got it. Okay. Right. So this one's pretty short, actually. Um, so this is an interview as well, actually. So should we just go? Should we just go back and forth on this? Yeah. Yeah. It's super short, so I think we can cover it all. Yeah, we'll just read it. Okay. So so do you want to? Uh, who do you want to be? Henry Henry Grunwald or Deng Xiaoping? I'll, go, uh, I'll be Henry. I'll be Henry. Oh, you'll be Henry. I'll, okay. be, I'll be the Anglo yeah. this time. Okay, okay, you'll be the Anglo. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Chinese Communist Party has always told people to be selfless and serve the people. In the current economic reform, you're telling people to become prosperous. But some cases of graft and corruption and abuse of power have cropped up. What measures are you going to take to solve these problems? We shall solve them mainly by two means. Education and law. These problems cannot be solved overnight, nor can they be tackled effectively with a few words by a few people. But we are confident that our party and our country are capable of gradually reducing these negative phenomena and eventually eliminating them. Are these phenomena indicative of a latent contradiction that is hard to resolve? A contradiction between a market economy and the socialist system? There is no fundamental contradiction between socialism and a market economy. The problem is how to develop the productive forces more effectively. We used to have a planned economy, but our experience over the years has proved that having a totally planned economy hampers the development of the productive forces to a certain extent. If we combine a planned economy with a market economy, we shall be in a better position to liberate the productive forces and speed up economic growth. Since the third plenary session of our party's 11th Central Committee, we've consistently stressed the importance of upholding the four cardinal principles, especially the principle of keeping to the socialist system. If we are to keep to the socialist system, it is essential for us to develop the productive forces. For a long time, we failed to handle the question satisfactorily. In the final analysis, the superiority of socialism should be demonstrated in a greater development of the productive forces. 
The experience we have gained over the years shows that with the former economic structure, we cannot develop the productive forces. <laughs> Sorry, repetitive. That's why we've been drawing on some useful capitalist methods. It is clear now that the right approach is to open to the outside world, combine a planned economy with a market economy, and introduce structural reforms. Does this run counter to the principles of socialism? No, because in the course of reform, we shall make sure of two things. One is that the public sector of the economy is always predominant. And the other is that in developing the economy, we seek common prosperity, always trying to avoid polariz polarization. The policies of using foreign funds and allowing the private sector to expand will not weaken the predominant position of the public sector, which is a basic feature of the economy as a whole. On the contrary, these policies are intended in the last analysis to develop the productive forces more vigorously and to strengthen the public sector. So long as the public sector plays a predominant role in China's economy, polarization can be avoided. Of course, some regions and some people may prosper before others do, and then they can help other regions and people to gradually do the same. Uh, I'm convinced that the negative phenomena that can now be found in society will gradually, gradually decrease and eventually disappear as the economy grows. As our scientific, culture, and educational levels rise, and as the democracy and the legal system are strengthened. In short, the overriding task in China today is to throw ourselves heart and soul into the modernization drive. While giving play to the advantages inherent in socialism, we are also employing some capitalist methods, but only as methods of accelerating the growth of the productive forces. It's true that some negative things have appeared in the process, but what is more important is the gratifying progress we have made, uh, we've been able to achieve by initiating these reforms and following this road. China has no alternative but to follow this road. It is the only road to prosperity. Yeah, there's there's all, uh, before we continue, I wanted to mention that there's also a, a great, um, a great text, I think it's called just China's history, I believe. Um, let me see if I can find it. Oh, hey, PT. I just want to say hey to the guy from Finland. Who... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so what Deng mentions in that in that one yeah. text, he says that, well, that the facts speak for themselves, right? China had yeah. uh, specific development periods and it had a specific conditions under specific regimes and those conditions and those regimes can be judged, right? Yeah. And a lot of the same thing is going on here in Mexico. We, so, um, so you guys call the American indep uh, independence uh, struggle, the American revolution, right? But here in Mexico, we make the distinction between the Mexican independence struggle, which was a liberal struggle and yeah. the revolutionary struggle, which is an actually left-wing popular struggle, right? Yeah. In in the case of Mexico, we had a you know a, a massively left wing movement, but since it's right next to the United States, uh, we had the 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 you know the misfortune of pretty much having all, all of our leaders assassinated, and so we had to capitulate and you know form a a center left government, so on and so on, right? But what I'm going uh, where I'm going with this is that we had specific uh, stages, right? Of, of the Mexican economy, which are drawn through, you know, very specific economic periods, right? Yeah. I, I, I think that currently in the American cli climate, uh, this has been also drawn to attention for the American history in the sense of, of FDR, right? People, you know, are calling for this Green New Deal. Quite, right? quite schematically, so the, the three things in American history people always cite um, in terms of political inspiration. And by the way, I'm not American, but mm -hmm. are, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you're Canadian. Are, uh, are uh, you know the revolution and its legacy, and, mm -hmm. um, though they usually don't discuss the full consequence of its legacy um, for different ideological reasons, um, and um, you know the liberation of the slaves, right, in mm -hmm. Lincoln, Emancipation Proclamation, um, and finally uh, the New Deal. Right? Those are usually mm -hmm. like the big, the big three. Right, and these are like their ideological, you know, uh, pillars and so on. Right. Uh, so in Mexico, we had our revolution, right, our independence, actually. Uh, what, and what happened was that we actually came, uh, you know, ran our way into a, into a liberal uh, dictatorship, and we yeah. had a president who was a liberal who stayed in power for over thirty years. Yeah, which right? is very common. It's very common in the developing world. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. But so I would I would add that I don't think that liberal dictatorships in the developing world have as strong a record in terms of achieving, um, you know, development as communist dictatorships do. 
in general. Yeah, and in fact, uh, Porfirio Diaz, you know, the leader of this dictatorship, is actually credited, you know, no, not Santana. Uh, again, Ender, Ender always thinks I'm talking about Santana. Santana is also, uh, it's also, you know, this kind of, of, of leader, but since he's, you know, back in colonialism, I personally don't really care, uh, you know, to talk about his contributions because I'm actually I'm more interested in the contributions of Porfirio Diaz as an industrialist, right? His intervention mm -hmm. in the industrial development of Mexico, which mm -hmm. was the actual time, you know, when when popular uh, land was, you know, removed and privatized and given, you know, and you know, the thing that is credited Porfirio, the thing that Porfirio Diaz is credited with more often is this whole thing of developing uh, railroads, right? Yeah. Railroads yeah. and productive and extractive industry, right? Yeah. But what actually happened is that he just gave away pretty much, you know, for a couple of bucks, all of our industry to foreign interests. Mm -hmm. So you had, you know, people from Spain, people from Germany, you know, everywhere in Europe, because actually a lot of people from France, um, our emperor, I mean, president, but, you know, yeah was almost an emperor, our president, he really fancied, you know, the French bourgeoisie. And actually, I think he was behind Mexico having, having its first department store, right? Uh, so these kind of excesses, they characterized a period from which we broke off, off right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Through our popular revolution, which yeah. was, you know, uh, it had leaders uh, very similar to Mao or whatever, yeah, mm -hmm. but in our case, they were assassinated, right? For, uh, Francisco I. Madero was, uh, yeah, 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 of course. Diaz most, was- Most, most, most third, world, third world countries had people like that, right? That's that's something people forget too, right? You know, even, yeah. even, even in the context of the late 19th century, like Garibaldi, you know, in Italy was like sort of a utopian socialist or something, I guess. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, he ultimately realized the, the incapacity of sort of um, founding a republic of his own means, you know, mm -hmm. that resorted to the, um, uh, the Sardinian monarchy. Right. Who then later turned over power to the fascists. So maybe not a good idea. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but but I mean, I just mean to say it's I think it's common, right, that you have some kind of social force like this. I just think that in, in most cases it becomes synthesized and even in China to some extent. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. 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 And then really, uh, really draws this out in, in, in the interviews. He's he constantly right refers to a specific historical moments and, and the text that I that I, I was talking about you know he says that he says like you know China under Japan was this kind of China China under the British was this kind of China right and it had this kind of and we don't want to go back to that that is capitalist China right yeah and in the case of Mexico we have a very similar um, mood I guess in the sense that we have the Porfiriato Mexico which was you know on on you know um, unabashed capitalism which mm -hmm. part, you know, which led to a popular revolution. So you can imagine yeah. you know, what kind of yeah. capitalism, right? Imagine if American capitalism had led to a popular revolution, how intense must it have been, right? Uh, yeah. So, and then we had, um, we had, a, a, again, after, yeah, Madero was boogie as fuck. Yes, exactly, Ender. He was too much of a boogie. And what happened is he got assassinated. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He, he was, yeah. Uh, he is, you know, he had faith in politics, right? And in not getting shot in the back. And that's, you know, that's not what happened. Um, so yeah, we had a reform, right? And so on and so on. And right now our president is running a kind of the same campaign, right? We had our, he, of course, he's not a, uh, you know, a communist or a socialist or anything, right? But we had neoliberal. He always says that yeah. neoliberal Mexico, mm -hmm. right? With yeah. Porfirio, with this and this and this president. And we are not going back to a neoliberal society. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too. Like, it's interesting about that. And I'll just bring up a, a, few, a couple of remarks as regards China. The first is when you go through these writings by Deng, one thing I find interesting is when he talks about, you know, the, the growth in like Shenzhen and Guangdong, right? One thing he says is like that, he says, look, like these cities have, have developed a great deal. This shows that, you know, we've taken the socialist road, not the capitalist one, which is a little bit of a perplexing like statement. But I think that what you have to understand is that like, you know, like the... The experience of capitalism, you know, obviously in certain urban enclaves and things like that, sure. But the experience of capitalism in the third world is not one of enrichment, right? It's one of, um, you know. Yeah, to, to me, that statement makes perfect sense because he, when he's saying we didn't take the capitalist road, to me, what he's saying is we didn't take the neoliberal road, right? Which is yeah. the road that hit my country and which I lived uh, through, right? So. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, he, he's he's saying something. I think he's saying something more than that. He's saying like we did yeah, of course, of course. To, to a road that because, you know, you have to ask, like, it's one thing to take the capitalist road, so to speak, when you have like a strong 
you know, when you have a highly developed private sector, right, that, mm -hmm. you know, in many cases, as in the West is, is, you know, usurping, or in almost all cases, right, substantial rents from, you know, third world countries, it's another thing to do it when you're the one whom those rents are being extracted from, right, opening up doesn't mean the same thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's, um, it's a bit perplexing, but I think it shows mm -hmm. you the discrepancy between the Western narrative of like, oh, China's just successful because it opens up, right? Versus, mm -hmm. you know, um, the Chinese view, which is that, uh, you know, there's actually the, these periods are actually complementary. I think that's the dominant view. You know, I mean, uh, Xi Jinping, right, the other year, he said, like, you know, um, the, the, the Mao era should never be used in order to discount the achievements of the Deng era, just as the Deng era should never be used in order to discount the achievements of the Mao era. Right. And actually, yeah. you know, less do you think this is confined to just like propaganda? I mean, you can read like Samir Amin. Right. Who basically says like, well, when you're a country that's as radically underdeveloped as Mao's China was, you know, and when you're trying to accomplish this kind of overhaul, it's quite logical to shut shut your borders. Right. Just as it's quite mm -hmm. logical to op open them at a time in which you've reached like a higher level of development. Right. And you're able to engage with the international world in a different set of terms. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I think that's the main Chinese narrative. Um, but uh, I just I do want to I do want to say as well, though, if I have a problem with some of these la these late 80s, like let's say high dengist kind of writings. If I have a problem with them, I think you can see a certain problem that emerges in his attitude. So like when he when he talks about Hong Kong, for example, he's like, oh, well, he's like, you know, Hong Kong, we're going to it's going to remain, you know, as it is for 50 years, after which it won't be necessary to change anything, you know, um, because, you know, and, and like, it's this like, Kind of like, uh, um, you know, or he talks about when he talks about the the pre Maoist sort of the pre his the, the Maoist era, right? He says like, oh, you know, like we, you know, it was damaging to close ourselves off to the outside world. We should never repeat that. And it's like I think he starts to to make these mistakes, in which it's one thing to say like what I'm doing is the right thing now, and I think this is earlier on the way he frames his argument, but he makes this mistake of I think generalizing too far the applicability of his own reform agenda which I think was relevant, you know, in its its particular moment. By that, I mean like 78 to 88 or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there, again, I think there are excesses. Yeah, right? and he says, he says, right, that they're, um, they're walking through, they're, they're the ones, you know, innovating in this regard and that they're willing to accept that if what they're doing is a mistake, you know, it should be corrected, which of course that doesn't actually happen, you know, that just, you know, putting that on the record, but at least they put it on paper. Right, part of a visual policy, I guess. Well, I think I think I think Tiananmen Square sends a wake up call to to the party about the need for for calibration, and I think that that message isn't isn't. I think Tiananmen Square is the first sign of like like you know something rotten, but I think that the message doesn't really sink in until you have instability in Western economies, like ten or twelve, fifteen years later, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, leading up to sort of the 07, 08 crash, right? Um, and then once the 0708 crash hits, that's just like two years before C, C comes to power, right? And I think that totally, you know, that totally creates a, a, a consensus, right? Yeah. It permits him to pursue a different kind of agenda, which I which I would which I would interpret as essentially syncretic, in the sense that I think, um, you know, uh, and I say syncretic for a reason because I'm not sure if the synthesis is totally adequate, but. But I think in the sense that uh, C attempts to present himself as a synthesis of the Deng and Mao eras, right, in terms of how mm -hmm. he's approaching things, um, which is basically like, oh, it's good we've grown, but now we have to commit ourselves also to addressing the needs of Chinese people, Medicare, air pollution, you know, cracking down on, on corruption and private sector monopolies and this kind of thing, right, without, without, without let's say, jettisoning, jettisoning the fundamental character of like, the Deng estate, right, as it was created. Right. Mm -hmm. So so there's a limit, you know, there's a limit, but there is an influence. You know, if you look at the centralization of power and you look at this sort of populism, right, and the attempt to address these these issues, which dog people. I mean, there is there is certainly a Maoist influence. Right. There for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you want to keep keep going on this? So I was I was yes. just uh, I was here. Yes. Um, the, yes. Um, uh, so Donald McHenry says uh, yeah. a professor at the Institute of Diplomacy of Georgetown University and the former US representative to the United Nations, he says, are you satisfied with the changes in the present governing bodies and leaders? Do you believe they will continue the policy of reform? I should like to call your attention to a recent party conference. Two important measures were adopted at that conference. First, 
After a review of the experience of the past seven years, we set an appropriate growth rate for the economy. We also adopted the seventh five-year plan, which was designated to create the necessary conditions for prolonged, stable development in this century and the next. Second, we made organizational changes to ensure the continuity of policy. That is, the average age of leading cadres began to be lowered, starting with the Central Committee and the Central Government Organs. The continuity of our policy depends mainly on two things. First, on whether the policy itself is right, and this is the most important factor. Why should we continue the policy if it is not right? If the policy is right and can promote the development of the productive forces in a socialist society and gradually raise the people's living standard, the policy itself ensures its continuity. Second, it depends on those who execute the policy. In both the central and local governments, there should be energetic people who dare to blaze new trails. After the third plenary session of the 11th Central Committee, we began to lower the average age of cadres. And of course, we've also been trying to make sure that they are more revolutionary, better educated, and more professionally competent. It was the 12th National Party Congress in 1982 that decided to convene the recent party conference. As the average age of members of the party's leading bodies was too high, it was decided that before the next Congress in 1987, a party conference would be held at which that age would be lowered. Okay, and then uh, Karsten Prager says, um, I do you want to say something? Go, go. Okay. I should like to ask a personal question. In your long revolutionary career, you have changed the destiny and orientation of the Chinese people over and over again. How do you wish them to remember you when you are gone? I hope they will never give me too much prominence. What I've done represents the aspirations of the Chinese people and the Chinese communists. That's all. And the party's policies were worked out by the collective. Before the Cultural Revolution, I was also one of the principal leaders of the party, so I should also be held responsible for some of the mistakes that made then. After all, no man on earth is without fault. Um, so that's the uh, that is the end of the. I love these. I love these. Uh, uh, and I, I like like even like you know I said like his. I like these sort of also pseudo. I mean, I do. I don't think he was like a really egoistic guy, as it goes. But there is a certain, you know, put on to the humility as well, which is quite funny. Like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and he gets really into this. Like at this this point in his career, he's like, he's like, yeah, like I just keep trying to retire, and like, you know, they can't. They're not letting me retire. He's like, I really. Yeah, want to he retire. actually goes into this in the next text, right? Uh, yeah, the, well, all uh, over. But but like yeah. even later, he's like, and he's like, he's like, look, I want to retire. He's like, but if things should get hot, I don't know. I might have to come back in. I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's kind of, um, uh, I mean, I think his main concern in this time was ensuring that the legacy of opening up would would endure, right? That was his main. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I think that to some extent, um, and I think the, the um, I would say that the influence of Deng is like completely dominant in China until probably around 2003. Like, I think like Hu Jintao starts to shift in a slightly different direction. Um, but really, again, it's not until C that you see a, a big paradigm shift. Um, but I think that, I think that, you know, in his latter years, I think the influence that he exerted wasn't necessarily so positive, right? Because I think that it prevented attempts to, um, you know, address directly some of the consequences that had occurred because of the opening up, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we have, uh, yeah, now we have, now we have Mike Wallace, this wonderfully, that, another interview, we got Mike Wallace, okay. Um, here we go. Uh, so they're talking about uh, Gorbachev's speech in Vladivostok, right? That's mm -hmm. the first thing there. Um, yeah. So I guess Gorbachev was trying to achieve a, a rapprochement with China after the Sino-Soviet split, right? So that's that's what he's discussing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then goes on about Kampuchea, right? He has, he's asking the Soviets to withdraw their support of Vietnam in Kampuchea because they think that without the Soviets, it they would just, you know, vanish. And he even says this whole thing that you were saying, right? He says, <laughs> the stationing of troops uh, by Vietnam in Kampuchea has actually, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, whatever, has, um, Kampuchea, has yeah. Kampuchea, okay, has actually turned Sino Soviet relations into a hotspot. Once this problem is solved, I will be ready to meet Gorbachev. To be frank, I am over 82, already advanced in years. I have long since accomplished my historical task of making overseas visits, and I am determined not to take any more trips abroad. However, if this obstacle in Sino-Soviet relations is removed, I shall be ready to break the rule and go to any place in the Soviet Union to meet with Gorbachev. Yeah, and it was <laughs> funny how even after he retires, like it's hilarious because he retires and then he goes to the States to be the, the Chinese representative to the States. So it's like, okay, yeah, great retirement there, right? <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, so this has been a longstanding issue, right? In terms mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the Vietnamese expansion Right, mm -hmm. which which I'm not so critical of because I think they had the reasons for doing all these things. Right, you know, even when they moved into to Cambodia, it was also a response to 
you know, the aggressions instigated by the Khmer, Khmer Rouge, as well as the the sort of human rights atrocities. Right? Yeah, of there. course. But this has been a uh, this has been a long time uh, issue with China, right? Who obviously, uh, you know, in the latter period of the uh, or during the Cultural Revolution, they'd given support to the Khmer Rouge, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I think quite a blemish on China's modern history, right? Um, but uh, um, you see, it's actually interesting because Deng was thrust into kind of a strange position because like Mao had, had a personal relationship with uh, Pol Pot, for example, mm -hmm. um, you know, and like the Cambodians sort of boasted, they were like, yeah, we're going to like accomplish what Mao did, but even more and even further, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it was like, in a, so in a way, like, you know, Deng was just not a fan. Like he was like, these people are fucking idiots. Uh, really, like he was really quite contemptuous toward like the, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but you know, he just, there's a certain, you know, alignment of blocks, right. That hard, that's hard to like shatter as a logic, right. Mm -hmm. That sets in at a certain point. Um, you know, again, I think, I think he did try to limit the scale of conflict with Vietnam. They had like a one week conflict, one week conflict. Cause there were some people who were like, we should just fight them head on even then. And Deng was like, no, I don't really want to do that because like, it's going to take in too much energy. They're pretty good to be honest. And like, you know, I don't think there's a real public appetite for that. You know, let's mm -hmm. go fight our Asian communist neighbors, you know, like, um, yeah. So it's a hard, it's a hard conflict to sell. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, he talks about the three obstacles in Chinese mm -hmm. American relations. Um, so after talking a little bit about, about Cambodia and the Russian situation, um, he says, he says the Russians, in other words, have to put pressure on the, the Vietnamese to withdraw troops from, from Cambodia. But uh, yeah. but then he says the three problems of the United States are are the support they've given to Taiwan, um, the uh, and uh, he says that their position of non involvement is comical, right? It's it's not a real, um, you know. Mm -hmm. In the 1950s, MacArthur and Dole's regarded Taiwan as an unsinkable U.S. aircraft carrier in Asia and the Pacific. Yeah. Um, and this, by the way, this is a big like people. I, mean, I think sometimes people are a little perplexed by why Taiwan has been such an important issue for China. And I think part of it, aside from like the symbolic significance of, you know, finally beating the Kuomintang and all that, but that's, that's quite abstract. I think the real reason why it's important for them is because of um, geographic proximity, right? And because its connections to the West have made it, uh, it's perceived as a site of, 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 of military liability, a serious mm -hmm. site of military liability. Um, but it's just, yeah. it's a very difficult situation, right? Because the, the autonomous evolution of the Taiwanese political system has created a situation now where I think I read 14.5% of Taiwanese, Taiwanese are in support of unification. So you've got 85% of the population opposed to it, right? So it's very hard, you know, it would be very hard to set up any kind of, of course, China could, but were they to try to impose themselves, you know, there'd be a massive international backlash, obviously, and it could only be done through like the application of brute force, right, in the early stages, right? Um, so it's a yeah, very which, which would be you know without, not without its American response. Well, as to whether the United States would would choose to, I don't think the United States would necessarily like. You know, I don't think that. Not to say that the United States wouldn't go to war with China, but I don't think that alone would be the. the, the Isn't the Taiwan? I thought the Taiwan Relations Act uh, is still you know uh, still. Yeah, yeah. It says here that Marco Rubio reaffirmed <laughs> it. In other words, that the United States that the United States will defend Taiwan. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, like you know, again, they would. That's I think so okay, they, okay, okay. They, there would have to be an yeah. appetite for that, for reasons yeah. for reasons beyond Taiwan. Is all I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe now there is, right? In terms of China's geopolitical. Well, they're but trying my to point is that they wouldn't do it. My point yeah. is just that they wouldn't do it just, like just for that it. reason, because like Taiwan's a very important geopolitical strategic asset, but like going to war with China is like. Kind of fucking big deal, you know. Like, there's a lot. You stand to lose a lot as well, right? If you mm -hmm. fuck up, right? Because you know, if if America were to go to war with Taiwan and they were, or sorry, to go to war with the China over Taiwan and lose, um, you know, the situation would never be the same in terms of um, how China approaches, you know, the uh, sort of U.S. block in in Asia, right? You know, I'm saying like like a, a like a decisive U.S. loss would greatly strengthen China's claim to regional hegemony, and it would cause them to likely behave in a way that was far more standoffish and aggressive with places like Japan and South Korea, right? Um, yes, most definitely, yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, you stand, yeah. You stand, I'm saying a loss could, could, could instantly sweep East Asia into China, China's hands, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You, ha you have to be quite careful about that stuff. And these are some of the most important US allies, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so, uh, so he says here. So he asks, yeah, what, what can they do, yeah. right? 
And Bank says they can encourage and persuade Taiwan first to have three, ex three, three exchanges with us, namely the exchange of mail, trade, and air shipping services. Contacts of this kind can help enhance mutual understanding between the two sides of the Taiwan Straits, thus creating conditions for them to proceed to discuss the question of reunification and ways to achieve it. And what I found is that by the 23rd of June of 2008, yeah. the three links were finally established. Okay. Oh, were they? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were sorry, officially established on the 15th of December of 2008. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And it makes sense, right? Because you've got like, you've got, you know, a lot of Chinese coastal cities that have become more and more important economically. Right? Yeah. I read that, that, that there, there were uh, a number of incidents. Actually, there was a big political controversy where, uh, where a plane crashed in the strait where it just, where it had to do like a connecting flight to Hong Kong so it could go to China. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, it, there's always these little flare ups, right? I know, like, when, when Trump got elected, he, like, phoned the Taiwanese leader. It was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, the, um, yeah. let's see here. Uh, so he says, he says here that uh, blah, 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 everybody in China wants the place to be uh, united. He, he says, we'll follow one country, two systems, so they'll continue to be capitalist. Um, so this was part of his author offer. Uh, Deng, you know, um, tried to you know, similar to, to Hong Kong, right? Um, but but even more definite. Um, what he offered Hong Kong was that uh, they would essentially be like a state within a state. Yeah. Right. That was basically his offer. So you see, again, like the goal is not here. You know, it's not about like, you know, getting all the Kuomintang who oppose them or like, uh, you know, um, you know, imposing a different kind of system. I think, I think the primary goal is just to neutralize whatever kind of geopolitical threat is emanating from that region. Right. That's the real issue. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it's interesting as well, because tiny Taiwanese companies played a big role in the development of China, right? In the Deng era, right? Because a lot of the foreign capital was Taiwanese, right? And Cantonese, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, those were, you know, even before the West, right? Those were the first major sites that went in, right? Those are sort of the pilots, yeah. right? Where like mm -hmm. Cantonese and Taiwanese investment and American companies, right? Came in later. Mm -hmm. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Taiwan, I like this. Taiwan has already tapped its potential, while the potential on the mainland has not yet been tapped and certainly will be will be soon. Though it's interesting because he notes that Taiwan's short of resources, which to some extent can also be said of all of China, right? Which is part mm -hmm. of why you get be, be a Belt and Road, though the scale is different, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, so the, the, the Wallace asks about how Western investors have complained about obstacles to investment, bickering about mm -hmm. contracts, exorbitant rents, too many special taxes, labor that's too expensive, corruption, corruption kickbacks, and Chinese bureaucrats. So... Deng responds. Um, uh, he just responds very generically, actually. Uh, Wallace, to get rich is glorious. That declaration by Chinese leaders to their people surprises many in the capitalist world. What does that have to do with communism? Uh, Deng, we went through the Cultural Revolution. During the Cultural Revolution, there was a view that poor communism was preferable to rich capitalism. After I resumed office in the central leadership in 1974 and 1975, I criticized that view. Because I did so, I was brought down again. Of course, there were other reasons, too. I said to them that there was no such thing as poor communism. According to Marxism, communist society is based on material abundance. Only when there is material abundance can the principle of a communist society, that is, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, be applied. Socialism is the first stage of communism. Okay, so this is very interesting about socialism is the first stage of communism. That's like specifically like Chinese, because, you know, Marx says um, the first stage of communism and the second stage in the Critique of the Gotha program. So that was like a, a definition that was specific to the De a redefinition that was specific to the Deng era, mm -hmm. right? Where they said like socialism is the first step to uh, uh, is the is the is the stage prior to the first stage of communism, right? right. So it, was an, it was an attempt to think some kind of trajectory, mm -hmm. right? That could be developed in that way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't I don't personally disagree with it. I don't know what you think. Um, yeah, I mean, like I think it's. Like, I think if you're just trying to apply it to like, I think it just depends on how programmatically we approach that. I mean, I was yeah. reading the debate. Yeah, between... yeah. I don't think, I don't think they are socialists, right? But I think that, you know, they are trying to build a state, uh, like an economy that can be called socialist. Well, they call it the primary stage of socialism. So again, like yeah. you have all these, all these, I, I think there's a certain level of self-awareness of instant the Denger in terms of the real level of that they're at, right? Yeah. Um, but, so, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, as regards all of this, I think it depends on how programmatic it is, because while I do think that, I mean, like, because I think the thing is that, um, you know, it seems to me that um, to try to gauge that development in one country is already a little bit difficult. Um, I mean, I think what I'm trying to say I, is... I agree that, with that, too. I agree with that, too. Yeah, I think I think that... I personally don't think that you can establish a kind of a one-country communism. So if it's socialism, right, it's like one out of the 300 countries with socialism that we need before we can actually call any sort of economy socialism, right? Yeah, yeah. And I also think that in a certain way, like, you know, if you look at, um, you know, it's it's it can be kind of naive, I think, to think like, oh, it's just going to happen that we build this movement, then it gets stronger and stronger, right? I mean, the, the actual thrust of history is much more complicated than that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you look at the defeat of like socialist movements in the 20th century, right? Well, obviously, you know, in, 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 a, in a very tangible sense, this is like a catastrophe, you know? Um, but at the same time, it's like it pushes capitalism closer to a kind of globalized real subsumption that also establishes new contradictions and creates the possibility of, of new forms of revolt that can unfold on that terrain. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I guess I, I view socialism prior to the achievement of that in some sort of um, vague structural sense. But I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's like, oh, well, you just build this regime that then programmatically oh, yeah, no. pursue, pursue socialism, then you... You know, you have to look at like the economic contradictions and the whole structure in a much um, in a much deeper way. And by the way, I want to add that. Um, so I was I, you know, because I think mm -hmm. people think I'm like this guy who's really against the ultra left. And, and that's not exactly true. Um, I uh, I was reading through the first issue of Endnotes and, you know, which is connected with Commune, you know, the Bay Area sort of scene. Um, and there's that that debate in it between. Um, uh, is it uh, Gilles Davé and the um, Thierry Communiste? in the, uh, there's a debate. So, so the first issue of, of EndNotes consists of a translation of this debate, right, that, that occurred okay. in French. And I think, yeah, it's it's, it's very interesting because, um, you know, I remember in, when I entered my master's program, um, my program director, Peter Hallward, he said like, oh, well, you should look at Theory Communiste because your ideas resemble theirs in some way. Um, and this is basically Theory Communiste sort of view. They're like, yeah, well, you know, if you look at the worker struggles in the 20th century, they, they they um, impose themselves at a particular juncture in capitalism's development, right? Um, you know, but they couldn't, they couldn't be completely actualized because of that stage of development, right? Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the, paradox, the paradoxical aspect is that, is that, you know, it's with the defeat of the worker struggles that we enter into a kind of new train in which the construction of something else becomes possible. Of course, they're not saying that it has to be socialism, like it could be barbarism, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, but the point is, you know, they, they see this as they, they, they criticize like, again, programmaticism is what they call it. Right. So it's the idea that you can just kind of produce a program and then pursue something like this to account for, you know, the sort of structural trajectory that's supplied by Marx's work. Um, and this is brought to bear against, um, uh, Dalbe, which is a more, um, conventional, maybe ultra left thesis, which is always just like, oh, well, you know, the workers in Spain at this point were like starting to acquire some kind of autonomy or like in Russia, but then, like, you know, the bad sort of like revisionists came in and like reimposed capitalist order, you know, under the guise of socialism. Right. And theory communist is a very good critique of this, which is basically like, you know, they're like, in a way, this is just like tautological in which like every single point, it's just like, you know, the proletarians didn't didn't, you know, uh, the proletarians weren't rat revolutionary enough. Therefore, the revolution failed. Right. You know, like it ends up being a kind of circular analysis that 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 doesn't take into consideration to any significant degree, um, you know, the, the the economic and social context in which these things transpire. Right. You know, it just it wasn't radical enough. They need to be more radical. Just push to this, you know. Mm -hmm. And and the, the the funny thing about it is, you know, theory communist criticizes programmaticism. Also, if it's naively suggested in kind of a Leninist way, but but they are they do consider these things part of the working out of this process. Right. Um, but you know, what they point out is like the ultra left position is not, you know, it criticizes actually existing socialism, but it shares a certain programmaticism, prog programmaticism with it. Right. You know, in terms of the idea that, OK, this is just what you need to do. Um, you know, just 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 just, you know, and it's not so well defined all the time. Right. But it's just like, you know, if we if we progress to this this form of the relations of production in this context that everything, everyone will be sort of liberated. Right. It's always vaguely um, kind of specified. Um, the point is that it it, it removes from the from the, the kind of flow of the historical dialectic what's actually occurring 
Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's the key actually. You know, mm -hmm. the its position in in historical time, right? Because mm -hmm. you know, if let's say the United States or Canada or Mexico were suddenly uh, seized by a left wing, you know, communist uh, administration, right? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't just abolish the value form, right? Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. not just what they would decree, right? They would have to be to have a, a program that adapts to its specific characteristics, right? It should appeal to spe to its specific um, economic development, right? To specific industries, to its strengths, mm -hmm. to its weaknesses, and China is doing that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Not 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 always perfectly, but no, but, no, of course not. Yeah, but, 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 I think, or, I think but it... at least willingly. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, and I think part of the, I think part of the, part of the, 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 uh, the paradox of Mao as a figure is you find in Mao's work some of the most, like, programmatic. I'm going to use this word now mm -hmm. from theory communist, sure. my new word, uh, from some of the most programmatic, and and kind of voluntaristic statements. Um, and you also find a real opposition to pr programmaticism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in, in in his best work, I think, like on contradiction and so on. Um, so that's that's sort of what Deng attaches himself to. Um, I think I think the risk is that Deng again lapses into his own programmaticism of quote opening up, right? You know, later on, right? Mm -hmm. Which is okay, we open up and maybe okay. It's like, well, <laughs> I don't think that's you know, and I'm not saying obviously you had a more sophisticated view than that, right? Yeah, yeah. But but that ends up being stressed too much, right? That would mm -hmm. be my my kind of take. But let's 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 push on here. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I think the the material consequence of that is that it's led to a particular to the communist party that we have today, right? With the kind of leadership that we can criticize right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and again, the communist party leadership today, basically having to function in that transformed environment, right? Um, and, right. and moderate and correct some of these excesses while simultaneously trying to preserve its power base, right? Mm -hmm. But, but you know, the, okay. the current Chinese struggle, it's basically between like the new bourgeoisie and, you know, a political class that in many cases can trace its lineage back to Mao, right? I mean, like yeah. if you look at if you look at Xi Jinping, like his father was a high level official, persecuted in the Cultural Revolution, and so on, right? So there's a there's a battle right now between an older political class, right, sort of the offspring, right, of this political class, um, who are trying to uh, affirm state power and regulate capital, right? Um, you know, in a manner, you know, um, partially influenced by this kind of socialist legacy. Um, and on the other hand, right, this sort of, you know, uh, uh, this new class of bourgeoisie whom Jack Ma has come to sort of epitomize, right? Mm, the yeah. Who are often opposed to, to this, these forms of state intervention, right? And that contradiction has become more acute because of C's attempt, you know, the way C has, has foregrounded some of the contradictions of development more and the need to rectify them, right? Um, mm -hmm. So let's, let's, push, let's push on here a little more. Yeah. Um, so, uh, should I read? Huh? Uh, well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to read the thing really so much because it's a little longer than the last one. Um, but uh, so far, I've never seen a picture of you in a public place in China. Why? That's a weird. Oh, he means like, yeah, OK. Yeah. So he's talking about like Mao style. I was confused. Yeah, I thought yeah, he meant yeah, like yeah. you've never been yeah. in public in a photo in China. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be kind of weird. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, uh, um. I like how he, the, the journalist asked him a question about what he'll say to Marx and, and Mao when he gets to heaven and what they'll say to him. And I like he just yeah. totally brushes off the question and just says, like, look, I've been doing this my whole life. Um, uh, uh, so he the, he's asked about what people will do after he leaves. And his answer is basically like, well, I think that if living standards are elevated enough, it's not likely that, you know, much of what I've yeah, he says, I believe the pe that the people are discerning, right? Which is actually yeah. the same thing that our president is saying right now. He's saying, uh, "I don't care what the, the what the papers say because here in Mexico, our our biggest press are usually privately funded and you know by foreign interests also." But he says, "I don't care what those rags say, right? What I care yeah. are you know what the people think, and if they're gonna they're gonna people are smart because he also so there's this in Mexico we also have this big cultural issue where where." You know, politicians would just demean, you know, people, like you know, people yeah. as a whole, right? And they would say, right, like you know, he would they would say just some misogynist things towards women. They would say just you know, very very um, rude things towards workers and so on. Um, I think there was a there was a particular remark, right, that one I think a, a former president even said, where he said that 
corruption was part of our, of our culture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of the, like of a people's culture. Right. Yeah. And you know, our current president, he's saying that's bullshit, right? Yeah. The people are honest, the people are discerning, right. And they will know better, which, you know, it depends on the level of education. Then also says, yeah. said, you know, in the first text, education, right. And policy. Well, I think I think culture is an interesting thing. It's like I think that you know anyone, you know I think anyone living in like a remotely modernized society, you know, and and maybe that's even you know stipulating too much, um, you know, will be aware of of you know the problems associated with what we term corruption, right? Um, yeah. You know, but I think I think to say that it's cultural is also to say that I think that when something becomes so rampant and pervasive, it becomes normalized, right? In mm -hmm. a way where people, it's like not like people think, oh, it's right. Right? Oh no! It's and as you're it saying, to be, it you, ceases you to be first treated. Time. Yeah, yeah. It, it ceases to be treated as as gravely as it should be. No, he definitely. Of course, the remark, you know, fell along that kind of line, right? But he was also saying, you know, it's inevitable, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, which I don't. Uh, and actually, I heard of something similar, and I think in Italy there was a, a court case some years ago where um, uh, someone claimed that it was okay, like influence peddling was a part of Italian culture. Mm -hmm. Right, like uh, you know, analogous to uh, you know, I don't know, snowshoeing in Canada, or uh, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, it's interesting these 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 the way these notions of I always find these notions of like cultural cultural essentialism always surface dubiously. By the way, I have a great yeah. comment here. Someone wrote about this group. Uh, mm -hmm. I posted this this link in learning about capitalism through Karl Marx, uh, and someone posted below this group. Don't these people know that Marx and Engels were Germans? Uh, so I thought that was an interesting. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting yeah. comment. Sometimes I feel like sometimes I feel like the comments like skate like you know alarmingly close to just being like straight up Eurocentrism like when people respond negatively like to, yeah you know um, and it's amazing by the way as as for this group like in terms of um, publishing it in different groups it's amazing like I, I wasn't that surprised that people were like oh yeah fuck Dang fuck Xi Jinping that didn't surprise me that much but what mm -hmm. did surprise me um, was the fact that like how many people were just like like no Marxists in that photo. You know the photo yeah. of Mao. Yeah, that happens every week. Yeah, you know, there's people like, like Mao. Where are the Marxists? Mao's not, Mao's not a Mar Mao's not a Marxist. Like it's like, <laughs> okay. I mean, they're all like, I, I'm pretty sure these people are all Marxists for starters. But it's particularly <laughs> the, the like, you know, Mao as like, you know, a veteran, like uh, a veteran of like, you know, and an master strategist of guerrilla warfare, right? You know, who like aggressively pursued, you know, a unique attempt to kind of, you know, build uh, a sort of social project, social communist social mm -hmm. project. Um, you know, it's particularly striking i think you know that people would would object to his credentials in particular um so i find that i find that weird but but i think like i think the i think the the i don't know like i think just like right now i see there is being i just see like i think like the the left is in such a divided position now you know in the in the west and i think it has like there's really just can't be any consensus i mean basically like after after the the cold war you had kind of like a takeover of like a lot of left environments um diminished mm -hmm. left environments by like kind of anarchist and like trotskyist groups um yeah which never really you know it didn't it didn't it's interesting in some ways it didn't to really deliver politically in the way that they, you know because they hoped that they would kind of have a a, a clean break right mm -hmm. to sort of rebuild the left but that, that didn't that never really happened um then you had then you have this sort of like you know democratic socialist stuff which did did you know acquire some popularity but but maybe its limits have been shown in the last few years and now mm -hmm. like i think also in the past few years you've had this big like you know like a uh, uh tanky resurgence especially popular which you can tell is kind of on the cutting edge because it seems to be particularly popular amongst like 13 year olds on the internet um well i just hope they hit 18 for soon and make their own party <laughs> um so i but i just think we're in an environment now where there's like you know, you really have like, uh, I mean, I, I, I would definitely see it. I said that I talked about the four stars of our, of our group, right? Like the four mm -hmm. classes and the Chinese flag, you know, like yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I really see there as being like, absolutely, you know, you have the, um, you know, I mean, you could say f you have really, I think like MLs, you know, and then you have anarchists and, and Trotskyists and, um, um, you know, democratic socialists, you know, and then sort of a Maoist thing as well. But, uh, it's like, yeah, it's just a very, uh, it's a very, it's it's a very divisive situation where it really, really doesn't have much of a center. 
you know, I think like, I think that, you know, an organ in the English speaking world, an organization like the DSA, which is fairly diverse in of itself, um, trying to project itself as a kind of center, but also I think recent developments have called that into question in ways that, you know, are, uh, potentially quite compromising. So, well, in terms of the group, I hope that we, that this whole thing that we're trying to do, you know, set up little local, you know, clicks so that they can have their own discussions, you know, and this, you know, do this kind of content and so on and so on. Uh, I wish that, you know, it follows this kind of programmatic approach of st staying away from just, uh, I guess, identity, I don't want to say identity politics. Uh, I feel like I'm, you know, simplifying it too much, but, um, you know, connect with uh, with their actual practical experience. That's what I want yeah, people yeah. to do with this with this kind of content, right? And with this kind of knowledge, right? And discuss we're history not... in, a, in a serious way too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing this so we can have, uh, we can orient our own lives, or at least, I mean, that's my, that's why I'm doing this, right? Yeah. So I can have an idea of, of what I want to do with my own life, right? And, and I can have an understanding that goes beyond what, you know, the media and, you know, uh, popular culture tells me, right? And to have an appreciation of it too. I actually, I loved a remark by Zizek recently. Uh, I, I always thought he wouldn't really, you know, care so much, but he said, yeah, that he takes so seriously the the superhero movies, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like, you know, we can go this whole LARPy kind of way and say, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're the, the true leftists and it makes sense that, that you know, that we don't get a lot of, uh, you know, of attention and so on, right? Because, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. we are pure, you know, right? Logically yeah. pure. But we, that's not that's not the point. We, we are supposed to, we, we should be engaging, right, with popular culture and popular discourse because it's ours too, right? It's part yeah. of us too. Yeah, and for me, like, for me, you know, I think like, you know, in terms of building an activist or theoretical base, which is different than, than building like a, an electoral base, um, yeah. you know, I think, I think just accepting, you know, the validity of Marx's works, that's kind of where I wanted to draw the line in terms of, you know, like, because you, you have to have a line to draw, right? When mm -hmm, you're, mm -hmm, talking yeah. about a group. And, and for me, that was the, the line to draw. Um, I've been mostly happy with how that's uh, worked out, though there has been, you know, obviously there's people who won't accept, you know, cooperation with other people who, who identify with yeah. them, you know? Um, but, but I've been mostly pleased with it. But let's, let's move on right here to the end. So, so mm -hmm. this ends, this ends just with, they talk a little bit of his retirement and it talks about how he told Ariana Falashi, remember that, that great interview, one of, one of Dang's great pieces. I said, he'd like to retire by 1985. And I guess now, uh, it's later than that. Right. And he says like, well, I keep trying to, you know, but they won't let me, um, to be quite frank, I'm trying to persuade people to let me retire at the people's 13th national Congress next year. But so far, all I've heard is dissenting voices on all sides. You know, that uh, that's funny on one hand. And on the other, um, that's what Porfirio Diaz said, right? Yeah. So, you know, not so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, though, I think that you have to situate Deng in context and understand that. Like, yes, of course, of course. He set, but he set still. term limits. He set term limits. He yeah. did kind of, he did, he hovered in the background. He did kind of weave a little bit as he got older. So it was a kind of mm -hmm. weird, like, you know, um, definitely like the, 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 the Maoist sort of centralization of power still exerted its influence, but in comparison, it was relatively benign, right? Um, like now, now is a lot more centralized with, with C, right, for example, um, mm -hmm. than anything Deng tried to accomplish, right? Yeah. Like I said, Deng never, never, like the chairman position was abolished, right? He never <laughs> held the, he never even held like the technical leadership position. It was just one of those things where you'd be, everyone would be like, oh, we know, you know, who, we know, we know who really... Uh, but the thing is, like, I think as much as I, what's important to understand about Dang is it's a weird thing because he could be the guy and say, like, you know, um, he could be the guy and say no, and that wouldn't happen. Right. But I don't think he didn't he didn't try to impose himself in all, all fields of, of governance. Right. So a lot of what he was doing was like, you do that, you do that. Right. And if he didn't like something, he'd be like, no, you're not doing that. Right. Right. But he wasn't trying to do everything just as one person. Right? Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it's just playing his part. Yeah, yes, which which turned out to be a large part. Yeah, uh, we, we have to say, and and I think it's interesting too because I was looking through. We'll move on to the next piece in a minute, but I was looking <laughs> through. There's an interview. I read a great book, by the way. I should mention this. Um, I read a great book uh, on that was it was done by Badia and two other guys, like in 1978, and it's a translation of um, a text by a Chinese. I don't remember the name, but like a Chinese uh, philosopher um of sort of the cultural evolution period the text is called the rational kernel of the hegelian dialectic 
And I think it's a wonderful mm -hmm. introduction to, um, and he, bas he basically says like, his, his stance is basically like, if you look at um, the different syllogisms and the way they function in Hegel's science of logic, that, you know, Hegel grasps the need, you know, because he talks about how like a book, you could go to flower, right? You'd say like, well, flower is, flower is red. Um, then you would say, um, how does it work? It's like a flower. So I'm talking about, talking about the different ones here. It's a flower is red. Then it's uh, a flower is a plant. Then it's, or what is it? Um, and then it's, anyway, I'm trying to remember, but, but the point here, sorry, I'm just, I almost want to pull this up. Just give me a second, okay? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember. It's actually an example from Hagel. I'm just trying to, trying to pull it up. I've read the science of logic. I'm just like, you know, when you read this stuff, it's just a, so much fucking stuff, you know. I've read I've read 18 books this year, okay? Okay, um, yeah. So wait. Uh, here we go. If you look at the... I don't have this all. I'm just bringing this up off the... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Roses are red, roses are useful, roses are plants, and the bouquet of roses is beautiful, right? According to the contents of knowledge, the sense of the predicates, the four types of judgment, become increasingly elevated. The first, the roses are red, is the most inferior such that the predicate of this type of judgment does not lay out anything but the particular direct and sensible qualities of the subject. Um, for determining if the subject does or does not have this quality, it is sufficient to use our immediate sensations. So this is sort of like Aristotelian, you know, like rain is defined by its wetness and so on, right? There's a certain historical understanding of this as well. Um, Hagel called these essential judgments. Um, do, do, do. The second type, the rows are useful, are called reflective judgment. The account of this, the predicate of this judgment does not only concern the particular direct and sensible qualities, but the determinations relative to certain connections of the subject. So to say, the rose is useful, right? Then you have the necessary judgment, which is the roses are plants. The accounts of predicates of this type of judgment are the relations between the substance and the subject. Like the reflective judgment, uh, it belongs to the stage of essence, but it comprises more necessary, uh, more necessity. It more profoundly and more concretely accounts for the content and peculiarities of the subject. So you see here again, then you have it put like related to a scientific category, right? Mm -hmm. Roses are plants, right? Um, so it ceases being either an immediate description or a description of its utility, right? Um, and then finally, you have the, a fourth type of judgment, the conceptual judgment, which shows, uh, that the concrete thing, the subject corresponds with the nature, with its concept and to what degree it corresponds. Thus, the predicates, beautiful, true, good. For example, this bouquet of roses is beautiful. This house is good. These judgments always compare a concrete thing to its concept. They compare this bouquet of roses to the concept of roses. So that's a judgment that, that depends upon the concept, right? He's already said the roses are a plant. Right. That depends. So, so it's sort of a it's sort of a theory of essences, but it's like a theory of scientific essences, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. It's not like a fixed like this is just this. It shows the working out of how that process functions. Right. So what the author and let me just get the name of the um, this guy was he was a writer in the. Um, uh, so it's sort of, you know, bad is like the big name here for sales. They kind of stress that. But mm -hmm. um, the, the, the nucleus of the text is by the Chinese Hegelian Zhang Xiying. Yeah, Zhang Xiying. So uh, what, he, what he sort of tries to show, uh, and, you know, I've been aware of this, but I think it's, it's interesting, uh, is the way that um, it's through, you know, you can see how this, this Hegelian theory sort of grasps toward like a theory of essences, right? Um, you know, again, like I said, that's scientific, but, but, you know, it never quite reaches the same kind of materialism that Marx postulates after, let's say, like the great you know, scientific upheavals of like the mid 20th, the mid 19th century, right? But you, but the point is to say there's a rational kernel, it's to say there's already this materialist element, um, which is latent in the Hegelian work, right? Um, you know, so I think that's important to recognize before we just say, well, Hegel is just purely idealist, you know? It's a really, really great, by the way, and if you, if you haven't got into Hegel or you're not interested in reading, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages of the science of logic, I really recommend that as a very effective short summary for Marxists. It's the best I've read. Uh, in that respect. The essay itself is like 30 pages mm -hmm. or something. It's very short. Um, but I was going to say, so in this, they have an interview with Badia as well mm -hmm. in this. And what Badia, Badia is talking about um, China. And I think it's Badia talking about China in this, but he talks about how it's like, it was sort of swept up in this wave of reaction, right? Which he compares to what happens with like Reagan and Thatcher. And I don't think that's totally wrong, but I think it's also important to understand that, you know, how far right you can push a system, right? Um, it is uh, predetermined in a sense by by the character of the political system itself, 
right? So what I mean is like, yeah, you could say, well, in China, there was a push to the right, but, you know, because the Chinese, Chinese, Chinese had already built a system that was, um, you know, socialist in a sense, right? Uh, it could only, it only went so far to the right, right? You know, so, so it's kind of interesting, right? Like, even if you look at China's current policies, in some ways they're comparable to, let's say, um, the most robust sort of policies of socialization that existed in, in Europe after World War II, different in terms of welfareism and how other things function, but let's just say, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like you get, you get these welfare states swept into being, you know, these kind of neoliberal, you know, more and more privatization and so on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but that, and then you have the Chinese communist system, which becomes a kind of mixed market, you know, uh, like, like social market or, or Keynesian kind of state, right? Um, and, and so I think that's kind of what happens in that period. But I just want to stress that today, I think the contradictions of capitalism with a way with COVID are acute, that what's interesting is the possibility of the Chinese system to go also in the other direction. Right? Um, I have a phone call. So sure, let sure. me. Yeah. yeah, just do that quick. Right? We're just gonna wait for Ernesto's uh, phone call. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think you kind of you kind of have to look at, at where a system is. And that that works on uh, ideological and and practical levels as well. Like actually, it's interesting in one of his his books, uh, Baudrillard. Um, I think it's it's like one of his first books. I'm trying to remember the name. But Baudrillard, he basically says like it's amazing if you look at the United States that they're they've accomplished. You know, their labor movements have been very successful. They've accomplished a high degree of socialization. He's writing like in the late '60s, early '70s, um, without you know this kind of emphatic marxist ideological element right um and he sees that as positive but it, it's very interesting that if you look at these developments that were built up in the united states that once the era of neoliberalism kind of commenced that i think they were much more um susceptible to to, to experiencing setbacks because they hadn't built that ideological element up right? yeah yeah i mean by ideological element uh what i'm understanding is that they just pretty much eradicated the bourgeoisie from their political system right what do you mean in China? Or what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay, I since I States. wasn't a phone call. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talking talking States. States. Okay. What I was okay. saying is that in the States, like, it's interesting because Baudrillard says, like, oh, like, the, um, uh, Baudrillard says, like, oh, the, in the late 60s or early 70s, it's Amer amazing how America's become, like, as socialized as Europe without this, like, emphatic Marxist ideological component. Like, its labor unions have been very successful. But I was saying it's mm -hmm. interesting because then when you get the pressures of the neo neoliberal period, American labor capitulates very quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think also it's because it hadn't built up as strong an ideological aspect as the European one, for example. Right. Yeah. Um, so even if the situation like, yeah, in 1965, the situation in, in the United States is comparable to most European countries. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the ideological situation as a consequence of the Cold War and so forth. Right. is quite different than, mm -hmm. you know, France and Germany and so on. Right. Um, so yeah. That, I mean, that, that, that ideological uh, situation, of course, had its material base. Right. It, they didn't have an, uh, the, the same kind of trade union support that Europe had, right? And in Mexico, we had a very similar development, actually. We, Lázaro Cárdenas, one of our presidents, he mm. tried to do a, a, a massive left-wing, uh, you know, a movement. Mm. And because he couldn't instill this kind of ideological uh, situation, right? Yeah. He even reformed our constitution to, to, uh, so to guarantee free socialist education to every citizen, right? Like, mm. that was on the constitution. Right, the third article, but you know that went away because we didn't have actual support. You know, it was just um, it was pretty much pandering, even I would say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think actually I don't think the influence. The, the I could be mistaken, but I don't think the difference is so much in union strength in the United States. Oh no, United. that's. Yeah. I think the difference. If you're talking about a base that mm -hmm. governs it, I think the difference is in extra union organizations. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah, by which yeah. I mean, like political parties, you know, um, you know, uh, institutions that diffuse knowledge and so forth. Yeah, the two party system is not working out very <laughs> well for the United States. Well, that's what Richard Wolff talks about when he talks about the Amazon mm -hmm. thing, which is very interesting. He says, like, the great success of like the Cold War propaganda in the United States was to sever the left from the unions. Right. Yeah. Um, so this is what I mean. It's like the unions themselves were able to carry on and have successes for as long as the government, what you know, was deciding on upon a Keynesian policy. But as soon as like, you know, unions enter, came into the crosshairs, right? When the government was shifting gears. Oh, shit. Sorry, I'm getting another call. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. As soon as unions came into the crosshairs in the United States, when the government was shifting gears, 
um, you know, they found themselves in a tremendously weakened position because they were they were unable, without the support of the broader society, right? They were unable to sort of um, defend themselves, right? Um, so I think you know this is, and and I really do think like you know, and um, it's interesting. I think at the end of of reading Capital, um, you know, Althusser talks about sort of the 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 travesty of the the German Social Democratic Party having. Um, you know, eliminated references, um, you know, to Marx and its official documents. Um, but I really do think that, you know, in terms of carrying on um, this sort of ideological struggle, I think that a commitment to Marxism has to be uh, absolutely uh, central to that, right? Um, which is part of part of what we do here, right? In terms of uh, diffusing these kind of things. Um, so let me just go. We're going to move on to the uh, we're going to move on to the third essay. Hopefully, Ernesto will join us in a minute. Uh, the third essay is Take a Clear-Cut Stand Against Bourgeois Liberalization. Um, and this one is also uh, very significant in light of if you consider what happens subsequently uh, in Tiananmen. Right. So just give me a minute there. This is from December 30th, uh, 1986. Um, so uh, let's see here. So here at the beginning, he's encouraging people to expel someone from the party, and this is part of this is part of uh, something Deng gets frustrated with. Um, he talks about sort of the discipline that that was instilled in party members, um, you know, during the 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 sort of military situations that were confronted in the Civil War, um, and he contrasts this with the tendency of certain younger party members to exercise uh, a great deal of patience when it comes to, uh, people making internal criticisms. This is also part of like the whole, uh, you know, part of the difficulty engendered by the whole, the whole thematic of opening up that's expounded through the Deng era. But here in any case, he's talking about, um, you know, Rang, Wang Ruang in Shanghai and he's saying, well, this guy should have been expelled. You know, people have been too lenient, uh, and so on. Um, so here we have the people have taken a laissez-faire attitude toward bourgeois liberalization uh, so that good people find no support while bad people go wild. Um, oh, you're off. We're on page 131, yeah. by the way. I'm just going through the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in developing our democracy, we cannot simply copy bourgeois democracy or introduce the system of a balance of three powers. I've often criticized people in power in the United States saying that actually they have three governments. Of course, the American bourgeoisie uses the system in dealing with other countries. When it comes to internal affairs, the three branches often pull in different directions, and that makes trouble. We cannot adopt such a system. Yeah, that's really interesting, too, in the States, right? Because, like, the president is, like, commander of the military, right? So they have this weird, like, project a kind of singularity towards other countries, right? But actually, mm -hmm. internally, they have this. Um, continue. Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually, again, you know, here in Mexico, uh, the, the, the Chamber of Deputies and the Chamber of uh, the Senate Right now, if if we hadn't, if the president hadn't founded his own party and built this whole mass movement, uh, definitely he would have lost. Right? He, I mean, I mean, not he would have won for the presidency, whatever. But the reforms that he's trying to carry out now, he just would have been blocked by the Senate, right, or by the deputies. But instead, he built a whole party, right, and you know, brought people from every state and every municipality to that party and won. Uh, you know, a lot of majorities. And right now, the, he has the majority in the Senate and the majority in the Chamber of Deputies. So now whenever the president says, oh, yeah, I'm going to send this proposition to the Chamber of Deputies to see what they say, of course, they say yes. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, and I think it's like, it's like interesting in the American system as well, because they have to like, I feel like, you know, part of this, this is like why you have this elaborate buildup of in democratic societies of like, um, mm -hmm. you know, civil servants and so forth. Because mm -hmm. it's like you have to, you, you know, like there are liabilities with that in the United States or Canada, as surely there are as there are in China, you know, which Deng mm -hmm. has outlined. He's like, well, if we have all these changes in government, how will we guarantee the security of Hong Kong, for example, right? Yeah. Um, so what what you have to do is you have to like surrender a significant amount of authority, you know, even in, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of Western democratized countries to sort of extra electrical, extra, extra electrical, extra electoral sort of bureaucrats. Right. And this this mm -hmm. is sort of the truth of this kind of, you know, when you get like like a QAnon talking about the deep state, you know, and this kind of thing like that is that is a sort of thing, too. Right. Um, Ulrich Beck has an interesting take on this in the risk society where he says like that, um, you know, there's uh, like the, he talks about something. He has a cool concept called reflexive modernization. And it's the idea that we're not we've passed the point of modernization. where We're just trying to, like, 
you know, um, create value. He says maximize wealth when I say create value as a Marxist. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've reached a point where, you know, all of the consequences of industrial development, like they're so acute that they have to be micromanaged. Um, so now we've had to create like this large class of like technocrats and scientists and so forth um, in order to address and mitigate the impacts of this. Um, so he calls it a kind of a, a process of reflexive modernization of the risk society, which he also mm -hmm. refers to as losing its democratic character in certain respects. Right? A risk because, society. Yeah, yeah. Well, like in, in terms of the risks engendered by capital accumulation, right? Yeah. And then yeah. how society sort of loses its democratic character because of like... Yeah, it becomes risk management. Is, is that what, what he says or what? Yeah, it becomes a risk management devoted to like managing the risks associated with capital accumulation without ever calling Fun. into question... Without ever calling yeah. into question the fundamental imperative to do this? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, you know, my work at the factory has a lot to do with risk management. So, yeah, this is like, <laughs> you know... <laughs> but yeah, sense yeah. Sense. No, we are implementing a risk management system and it's uh, an industrial operating standard, an industrial yeah. standard of operations. Yeah. Well, capitalism is always been, I mean, it's like always been about that. It's like insurance. Like, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm sure there's like a book. Like, I just love to know, like, just kind of fundamentally and ex existential historically what like the, the history of like insurance is. You know, <laughs> because it seems to me that in many ways, like, you yeah. can read like the proliferation of capitalism and its reflexivity as like a proliferation of insurance based schemes. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you put this amount of more money together, you know, social welfare and everything, right? Put, put this mm -hmm. amount of money together. If anything really bad happens to you, you know, and it's a way of covering the supposed liabilities. Part yeah. of the next point is like the liabilities now are so great that like it's almost ridiculous to discuss them in that light. He's like, mm -hmm. like, how do you how do you ensure against like nuclear catastrophe or like, a, <laughs> you know, like environmental collapse? He's like, you yeah. know, it's kind of surreal to talk about these things, you know, which which Dr. Strangelove, for example, satirizes. Mm -hmm. as a film. Mm -hmm. Like the idea you could even talk about something like nuclear war, like logistically. <laughs> it's like you know um so um let's let's just move on here um mm -hmm. so he talks about the three power system in the states um mm -hmm. he this 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 goal of raising china's gnp per capita to us four thousand dollars which i never know if he's like pegging it to pegging it to inflation or not but anyway today mm -hmm. it's like eleven thousand or something so um his big goal is to do that by 2000 which i think but dang dang always likes to 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 you know, um, under report and overachieve, right? So to speak. Um, yeah. Except with official growth targets, which he did drive up because of the, the effect that has an animating industry. But when it came to like making these kind of political projections, he would always sort of under report and overachieve. Mm -hmm. um, do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. He says, I think this is like almost shockingly candid here. We cannot do without dictatorship. We must not only reaffirm the need for it, but exercise it when necessary. It's very, very candid. But I guess also, you know, this would evoke dictatorship of the proletariat, probably, right? He says, if some people are bent on provoking bloodshed, what are we going to do about it? That's a good, and that's just like, that's just like a peak dang kind of quote right there. If some people are bent on provoking, but what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a peak dang moment right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, he talks about uh, do, 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 do. in the recent student unrest, the Democratic parties have taken a correct position, and so have well-known Democrats such as Zhao Juqing, Bei Zhao Tong, and Cheng, Cheng Hui Chen. Unfortunately, we cannot say the same of some of our own party members. Really, putting a few of them on blast there, right? He's like, you guys are even shittier than like, like you know. Um, I assume he's talking about other like uh, people who come from other political parties, like like mm -hmm. official Democratic parties in China that are sort of like steered by the state in certain ways mm -hmm. um but not officially the communist party uh and so he has this whole like here he's just really fucking mad like a few people in the party who he sees as being too soft on uh we must resolutely impose sanctions on lang liji lu binyan and wang rei wang who are so arrogant that they want to remold the communist party what qualifications do they have to be party members <laughs> he's really pissed off right um mm -hmm. uh this real like with Dang, there's like this real sense of like you know this a certain ego too in terms of like I was there, I was fucking there, I was fucking there in the Civil War. We fucking did this shit. Fuck you. What do you even know? Like this, like you know, like, and I think I like yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it's a little supercilious sometimes, but I do think that he has a certain like. There's a certain kind of I, I would say there's something to it. I mean, like in the sense that I think when you grow up in a country in which those things already exist. You know your tendency maybe isn't to grasp fully you know how big a difference that makes to mm -hmm. people's lives right or to like to take china and like contrast it with a country in africa that's far poorer 
and to realize as well, like the centrality of the Communist Party in that mm -hmm. history. You know, people don't necessarily see it from that level, right? <laughs> Which I think, I, you know, I think Deng is a very broad perspective also because he, he lived through such huge changes, right? Like mo neither you nor I have lived through anything approximate to that, right? I'm sure Mexico yeah, is of course. more than yeah. Canada. Yeah, Mexico's Mexico is violent, but it, it's not in civil war. Yeah, I'm just talking about change, right? And what I'm saying is when you live through change mm -hmm. of, of that type, you know, it's like mm -hmm. if I talk to my grandma about, you know, COVID or, or economic change or whatever, you know, like in a way, um, you know, in terms of um, economic issues, there's a certain kind of open mindedness, you know, because like she saw like, you know, the creation of the middle class kind of in Canada. You know, mm -hmm. when you've seen that, you realize like things can change very radically. Like that was against, you know, sort of the conservative orthodoxy prior to that. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> if you talk to a lot of boomers or, you know, sort of early Gen X or whatever, um, like, you know, my mom and my dad, they don't actually seem to be able to conceptualize, you know, those kind of apocal changes. Right. Um, you know, they have many other strengths intellectually, at least my mom. I don't know my dad, but well, OK, he has some strengths intellectually, too. I just like, to <laughs> but, but okay. Um, but the point is that they haven't, they hadn't, you know, growing up like in, you know, seventies, eighties, nineties, yeah, there are changes, but it's like, you're not, it's not like the thirties, forties, fifties. It's not, you know, you don't see that, that scope. Right. So I think when you think of someone like was when he, you know, when he started and looking at what it was later, right. And all the transformations, all the upheavals, all the wars, all the development, cultural revolution after it's like, I think that just broadens your perspective in a certain kind of way. You know, if you have any kind of ability to synthesize that intellectually, you know, I think that just, and a lot of people just melt down. They can't handle it. They either become disengaged, nihilistic, or just, you know, um, you know, like entirely sort of undialectical and they're avowing fidelity to a certain historical moment and proclaiming everything after to be worse or whatever. Right. Um, I guess what I mean is if you remain, if you remain kind of, kind of, you know, intellectually agile and you synthesize those things, I think it broadens your perspective. Mm -hmm. bit, right. I'm not saying all transformation is good, but I'm just saying, I think all transformation can have that effect in Yeah, we should be open to transformation. Yes, we should be open. We also should combat it sometimes if it's negative. Um, mm -hmm. But I just meant whether it's good or whether it's bad, right? I think that, you know, if you can intellectually synthesize it, I think you're going to end up with a broader perspective. And so I think it's different. You know, I think that for, for people who are thoughtful, you know, who, who live through those kind of things. I think it is quite remarkable, you know, and, mm -hmm. and China going forward, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in China, but it probably won't transform as much as it has in such a short period of time, right? Between, you know, 1940 and 1990, for example. Like, I really doubt to, to 2040 will be comparable to that. Yeah, I don't think so either. And and it's growing really, like, it's changing really fast. So I'm, I'm saying mm -hmm. relatively. Yeah, but it's stable. Right? It's stable. Yeah, it's it's like rapidly transforming economically, but stable. Yeah, but these are big changes too, right? Like you go to China, like look at like 10 years ago, it's like all the biggest blockbuster films are American. Today, most of them are Chinese. That's a big change. Like, I don't know. I haven't been exposed to a block, a tectonic shift in what's presented at cinemas in my lifetime. Yeah. And I'll just do that, you know, and that's yeah. just one area of people's lives, mm -hmm. right? So you're seeing, you're seeing all these things. I mean, 10 years ago, China was, you know, um, uh, kind of low end tech supplies. Right mm -hmm. today, it's like they're you know today it's like you got like uh, iPhones, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, pretty smartphones, pretty much, right? You have. I mean, they make iPhones. What I'm saying is today, in terms of domestic industry, you have Tencent and Huawei and all this stuff, and now they're getting into like a video games, you know, and that's coming, mm -hmm. right? That's kind mm -hmm. of the next thing. So yeah, these are these impact. are yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, well, I was reading about that too, and and mm -hmm. um, I don't think the Western game industry is really you know because because I think what we're going to see in the next you know what for video games and that's that's one yeah. yeah you should watch wolf warrior it's not very good but just as like an event like just as like a you <laughs> it's know, a cultural you know, signifier yeah. yeah 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 like i i like i i did kind of enjoy it just because it's so ridiculous but uh <laughs> like um but um yeah i mean that's going to be the next big thing right because like i think i think traditionally with with games you've really just had like japan and north america really dominant you know, and then like you got some stuff from Britain and France. Okay, when yeah, I say North yeah, America, yeah, Montreal, yeah, that's true. <laughs> some stuff from Britain and France, yeah. Okay, Montreal, yeah, yeah. Ubisoft, Ubisoft, yeah, yeah. Montreal is is French, yeah. But, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. No, but like I guess what I'm saying is like I wouldn't like I wouldn't the Western industry is is somewhat homogenous in terms of how it functions, 
like because yeah, like yeah, you've got Ubisoft, which is French, but then they're in Montreal, and like the Canadian American markets are very very connected. Um, so the big the big divide is kind of and, and look, you know, Canada has a lot of developers, but it's it's culturally conjunctive with the states. Britain and France have less, but have done some interesting things. Um, but the real thing is America, Japan. Yeah. Um, and like, but I think that for video games, like, and I'm just using this analogy to many other things, that's what you're going to see in the mm -hmm. next 20 years. You're going to see China is going to become the third, the third power, right, of game design. And I'm sure it's not going to be pretty starting up. You know, it's probably going to probably going to make they're probably going to make some pretty rancid shit. You know, Genshin Impact is very cute. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That makes some. Good stuff. That makes some good stuff. But but like I said, I'm sure it'll be a rough. It'll be a rough start. But uh, I'm sure yeah, after, yeah, yeah. after a few decades, they'll figure it out and have their own mm -hmm. design class. And I don't know if they'll ever reach like, you know, the the pinnacles of 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 critical acclaim that the core Japanese developers have because that's so early in the medium's development. Um, but frankly, I cannot say. Um, and it would be ridiculous. To, I don't know. Maybe maybe the the greatest you know most important game company ever will be Chinese. I don't know. We don't know. So we'll see. But that's just an example of the shift made in tech. In tech sectors so what i mean is yeah there's been stability but there there has been stability in china that's that's been fundamental but there's been big shakeups abroad right the COVID affected ironically came from china but affected other places a lot more the 08 recession trump you know far right and so on there's some big shakeups abroad. Yeah, brazil the uk yeah yeah yeah, yeah. There's chaos everywhere yeah the situation uh, the is excellent thing, yeah the other thing is that their internal development has been so fast that it creates a kind of um whiplash <clears throat> right even there so i mean yeah they've had let's say fundamental stability but there's been all these other other factors that have been kind of swirling around mm -hmm. as well, too um but uh let me let's get let's get back to this mm -hmm. um the struggle against bourgeois liberalization will last for at least 20 years democracy can develop only gradually and we cannot copy western systems if we did that would only make a mess of everything <laughs> our socialist construction can only be carried out under leadership in an orderly way an environment of stability and unity that's why I place such emphasis on the need for high ideals and strict discipline. Is there something you wanted to, to read here? No, I'm reading I'm reading Ender's comments. He's just making me laugh. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he talks about the struggle against the rightists yeah. in 1957, how it was carried a bit too far. Um, uh, we must show foreigners that China's political situation is stable. If our country were mm -hmm. plunged in a disorder and our nation reduced to, reduced to a heap of loose sand, how could we ever accomplish anything? Uh, the reason the imperialists were able to bully us in, in the past was precisely uh, that we were a heap of loose sand. I like this heap of loose sand. Yeah. Right? Uh, dealing with the student disturbances is a serious matter. By the way, uh, as regards mm -hmm. Tiananmen Square, a lot of people in the West don't realize this, but it seems like there's flare ups there every few years. Like it's a it's a mm -hmm. sort of eternal site of. Yeah, yeah. The You've same got, thing you know, happened in Mexico at Tres Culturas for a while until yeah. it stopped happening. Okay, so that's your that's your site in Mexico City, I gather. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, you know, Mexico City, uh, according to our internal polling, Mexico City is the, our, our like second most popular. Uh, it's the biggest city in the country. I told people that we were, we were going to start our special, uh, IRL zones, mm -hmm. special meat, meat space zones. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Our in, special economic. Yeah. Yeah. In, in London, Ontario and Mexico City. And Greg just laughed his ass off. He was like, <laughs> these are most fucking random places. You <laughs> London, Ontario. In Mexico City, we have a weird thing in London, Ontario, because I think they've got like a big like continental Marxist department there, which is why I think okay. we have like a big at Western University over there. Great, that'd be great because you get actually I, I should have went there. That would have been a great place for my BA because you have this continental Marxist philosophy thing. Then you also have this like it's the big the, considered like the um, the real business school hub of Canada, and consequently like the party school. So this would have mm -hmm. appealed to my you know sort of uh, white boy summer side. Yeah, of <laughs> just in time. <laughs> yeah just you know you can you can go like talk do your theory talk with the the guys over in philosophy then go party with the business it's kind of a good good mix mm -hmm. right um i love i love schools that have that party element though you know i was always i was always right in there the the beer keg parties and stuff like that, mm -hmm. I, that. I'm, I know this is terrible i'm never gonna i'll never be i'll never make a department chair um, oh no same thing here in mexico don't worry <laughs> well you guys you guys you guys are pretty indoor you guys are mexico's a party place right you guys know that a party country yeah sure country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 sure <laughs> um but uh so he talks here about um uh so he talks about the three articles relating to the disturbances that were published in people's daily were well written uh and mm -hmm. so was the editorial that appeared in beijing daily entitled big character posters are not protected by the law you know these are the famous posters they put up right yeah yeah they put them yeah 
<clears throat> the remarks made by, made by Li Rohan and Tian Jin were also good. The fact that the leading cadre has taken an unequivocal stand encourages those who are firmly opposed to disturbances and helps to persuade those who are uh, undecided on the matter. <laughs> disturbances can be checked if the leaders take a strong stand. So that's the end. That is our third yeah, there we go. article. And uh, mm -hmm. I have... Uh, well, maybe I'll hold off for a second because before we get into the next, um, before I give you the readings, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, this thing about religion um, that we've had in the group, a little discussion about religion in the last few days. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like there's a lot of um, confusion and maybe uh, lack of clarity um, in terms of how people understand my position. So um, what my position, what, what I was frustrated by was the tendency of certain people to elide the critique of religion in Marx's work, right? So I, 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 this sort of started because of this meme, right, that I saw, you know, and they talk about Marx saying, you know, religions that, you know, because people always say religion is the opium of the masses, then someone gave this larger context where he says it's the side of the oppressed people. But it's interesting that that larger context did not include Marx saying, you know, the abolition of religion is, is necessary for the realization of true happiness amongst the peoples. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, of course. but. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I cited a few factors which I think have caused a certain softening of the Marxist position toward religion. And I mm -hmm. cited three factors. I think one is the uh, <clears throat> an attempt to distance, um, you know, our, ourselves from kind of new atheism and like vulgar polemics by, you know, sort of yeah, like yeah, Richard yeah. Dawkins. Some I, yeah, I think another is the important centrality of Christianity to the, the writings of people like Badia and Zizek. Um, yeah. and I think, I think a third factor is just sort of, um, you know, new age views or liberal multiculturalism that have come to, um, discreetly influence our discourse in some ways. So they're different things because Zizek would say, well, I'm very against, you know, liberal multiculturalism, but, but there's still a positive appreciation of religion in some ways. Um, pretty much anything, like pretty much anything people want to say, you know, up to a certain point, I would accept. You know, some people have said, well, you can't lump in all religions with Christianity. Sure. I mean, Marx said religion is the peculiar, um, you know, Christianity is the peculiar religion of capital. Right. Um, you know, I mean, it's obvious that in terms of the commodity form, and I do believe that there's a certain symmetry between religious structures and that of the commodity form. Marx makes his own comparisons. You can go look at the Grinrissa and so on. Um, Alberto Toscano in Fanaticism says, isn't it the case that religion is a real abstraction, right, mm -hmm. um, of commodity exchange? Um, and he's talking more about monotheistic religions and so forth. Um, I think uh, I, I accept all that, but but of course it follows that there are certain religions, you know, that less exposed to market conditions, let's say, which don't reflect that to the same degree. So I cited animism as being interesting, right? Because there's no kind of dualism in it. And I, for me, you know, I think of dualism as being based on the the epistemic standpoint of the commodity form, right? Um, so, and it's like, what is religion anyway? Is this like all, all pre-modern views except the Greeks? Like, what does that even mean? So all this I get, right? Um, so I'm not trying to say like all religion is the same or anything like that. But the thing is, even if we say like, you know, okay, well, some religion is oppositional to, you know, the standpoint of capital, right? Mm -hmm. Which I would accept. That doesn't mean it's like an adequate solution, right? You know, like and I said, I wouldn't go around promoting like primitive communism either, you know, like, but that doesn't mean that I think that, you know, primitive communism is capitalist, right? Like there are things sure. that you wouldn't promote. Not because like not because they're capitalists, but just because they don't they're not adequately synthesized with the developments of modernity, right? Now, am I going to treat Christianity the same way I'm going to treat something like that? No, right? You know, indigenous spiritualities or something like this. No, it wouldn't make sense to treat them the same way. But it doesn't mean that that either should be actively promoted, right? Now, tolerated, right? Um, you know, encouraged in relation, you know, to another kind of you know uh, spiritual belief which is encroaching itself, perhaps. Right. But 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 encouraged in an absolute sense. No. Right. And, and I'm very sensitive to the need to exercise strategy in all these cases. I mean, there's lots of places where religion is totally pervasive. And, you know, you don't want to pit yourself against that as an as an, you know, as pertains to the question of abstract belief. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are also situations. Let's not kid ourselves where uh, religion doesn't function on anything like an ideal plane, where it's extremely active in the material organization of society and where overcoming it is a requisite to achieving the economic goals, which we claim, you know, should we achieve will lead to the dissipation of religion. So this is what some people yeah. say, why don't we do to accomplish these economic goals and let religion dissipate, right? Mm -hmm. well, what about if religion is a very central obstacle to that, right? Because the articulation between politics and religion, right? And I think this division is just a consequence of, you know, the reformation really, but the articulation between those elements is different in every context. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it would be silly to say religion is just the superstructure. 
And yes, Marx says it's the superstructure, but he's also speaking from a certain European context, right? Um, and I think that the, 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 you know, I mean, and even in Marx's time, you could see the waning of religion in a European context. And he's also thinking about tendencies. Um, but today, in many ways, you know, religion's stronger than it was a century ago in many contexts, right? You know, that's, it's certainly stronger in the Middle East, right? It exerts more political influence than it did before the Six Days War, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, you know, you can't just talk about religion like, oh, it's dying, you know, capital's overtaken it, you know, it's not a big deal. Like I said, Alabama, India, right? Look at, look at Hindu fundamentalism, right? What that's doing, right? The Middle East, on and on. And these aren't just ideal things. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you're from Portland or New York, I wouldn't expect you to foreground the struggle against religion. It's a waste of time. Right. Mm -hmm. But the point is, you can't you can't make these. You know, it's not acceptable to make these kind of it, one. It's not acceptable to make these kind of generalizations. Religion is just a superstructure. Let's change the material conditions first. Every situation is different. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of them religion has to be con confronted head on. Right. Or at least certain manifestations of religion. Right. You don't have to say we're anti Islam. You can say we're anti that group. Right. You know, so mm -hmm. you're trying to uh, diminish its political efficacy. Yeah, uh, like, and there says uh, Shinto nationalism, right, from Japan, also, you know, to take away from Islam. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, you could, yeah, like, that's, you know, these are all, I don't know, I don't know if Islamism is a big problem in Japan, I don't think it is. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting in Japan, because you did in the 80s, mm -hmm. you had the first religious terrorist attack in the century, in the century, which was the toxic mm -hmm. chemicals released by the... Um, the, the siren gas attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And here in Mexico, we had a, we have we have a lot of problem with sects, right? We, I'm sure same thing happens in North America, right? But you know, mm -hmm. in Mexico, we had a, a big problem with sects. And there is this one by a guy called Keith Ranier. Yeah. And you know, yeah, yeah. You guys know about it, right? No, no, no. No. Okay, okay. Yeah, I thought you, uh, because you said yeah. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so this guy, he uh, actually has his hands in the pockets of a lot of politicians. So, yeah. And you know, and that's and it's supposed to be a, a religion. Um, yeah, it's a cult. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it's a it's a religious practice for them, right? That's how they excuse it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it provides a license for certain negative things. But I just want to say here as well, people sometimes confuse the arguments, right? Like okay. sometimes people say things to me like, you know, but isn't it the case, as you know, Badia and Zizek show in some way that Marxism itself is structurally indebted to Christianity historically? Sure. sure. I'm not mm -hmm. arguing against that. But that doesn't change the fucking position, right? You know, like it's like you know, Marxism is a further dialectical. If it, if it, if yeah, it, it's if historical it, fact. Yeah, it's a, if 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 these, you know, and it's based on a certain set of conditions, a certain conjuncture, and emerges, mm -hmm. and it's true for this time. You know, nothing is going to be true in the absolute deterministic sense. But that doesn't exactly. Mean, that doesn't mean that you can't take positions on these things. We have to take positions on these things, right? What those exact positions will be will vary. But what we need to accept universally, I think. Is that uh, if, if you're a Marxist, if you're indebted to this cause, that that the long-term goal has to be the abolition of religion, to core, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think I think it's very dangerous to get into softening that position, um, and I think it speaks to um, a more, I, and you know, like like someone actually just in the in the thread they said, um, yeah, but religion's more important than any of the texts you've studied. Okay, like maybe, right? Maybe it's more important, right? Is it more important for now, for what we're doing now? Maybe in some contexts it is. You know, yeah, but, but that's not enough. that's not what we are. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not here to discuss which book is more important than which book. It's all right? changing. That's right. yeah, it's about it's about how we're gonna change reality and the way we're mm -hmm. gonna do it. Right. And and the fact that religion is important, the fact that it may have certain religions may have done good things in the past. That's great. Yeah. That's great. It's not the point. Mm -hmm. Right. So so it's not about adopting some kind of vulgar approach. That's not the point. It's actually just about you know understanding why Marx said that, why he was right when he said that. And, and adapting that to whatever, you know, the conjuncture that you're in, right, in terms of how you're mm -hmm. going to pursue it without losing sight of the fundamental goal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, just like, you know, I'm against, I think I want to abolish the commodity form. You know, I'm not saying no one can use money tomorrow. But if you say, well, you know, if you say, we'll let people use money, right, okay. You know, if, if, if you know, if, if something, you know, if people are going to continue using money in a socialist state, then you shouldn't lose sight of what the objective is here. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that's very, very central to our identity and who we are trying to, you know, understanding what the final goals are and trying to work toward them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I just find I'm a bit baffled by the responses. You know, someone put up a, a, a strong materialist point. They said any any ideology that distracts people from understanding um, material reality is a problem. OK, well, I can see why you could maybe accuse this of a certain vulgarity because like quantum physics isn't, you know, exactly material reality. OK, but I, I accept the basic idea. And for to see people putting like laugh reacts on that and stuff in a Marxist group, right? It's like, you know, are we materials or are we not materials? 
Mm -hmm. You know, because this is like, you know, again, materiality is complicated. Don't get me wrong. I don't accept like a, a vulgar notion of materialism. If anything, my notion of materialism is more connected to economic form and economic structures. But that doesn't change any of this. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I'm saying we have to have a materialism. We have to pursue that materialism. We have to have an understanding of these things. So, um, you know, and I think it's just more connected with, I think it's connected with the fact that in our group, there's a lot of people who do philosophy. And I think there's a strong tendency when you get into that, right, that, you know, to, you know, if you want to present yourself as like legitimate, mm -hmm. right, to, uh, to um, water down your Marxism, you know, with a lot of sort of idealistic um, fluff, you know, to do that. Um, yeah. And yeah, I can see that happening. Yeah, no, and it happens. And and so my personal goal, again, when I talk about a materialism without matter, which is a term from Bali Bach, when I talk about economic form, right, when I talk about looking at materiality in terms of economic, uh, uh, you know, we've talked about real abstraction and so forth, right? Um, you know, it's a way of, you know, cleaving to an anal analysis, which is very, very material, right? Um, without just resorting to a, a materialism of, of brute material reality. Right now, I do accept that. I think that I think that kind of, you know, the the real, so to speak, kind of, kind of the the, it can be kind of accessed in the pores of economic form. But I think what we also have to acknowledge is that we're so conditioned by these kind of economic forms and structures that we can't just access what's there. I mean, mm -hmm. right. So the question of form has to be resolved before a true kind of brute materialism, if you will, could ever even begin to be accessed, whatever that would would mean. Right. Though I think we have some clues in terms of ecology, quantum physics, blah 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 blah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of my my position toward this. I, I do realize, like, I don't want to approach this and say it's not a nuanced question, but, you know, I just think one has to be very, very skeptical about this, like, you know, well, these are all just like metaphysics and Marxism is like a metaphysics and like, therefore, you know, or like, a, mm -hmm. you know, Marxism privileges the base and the economy and like, you know, Gramsci, you know, I actually learned, I told you, Althusser wrote a whole monograph critiquing Gramsci, que you know, that totally changed my um, oh yeah, yeah, you posted about it. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, know, it and it'll be trans. It'll be coming out in English soon too. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, uh. Well, I mean, you know, I like, I kind of, I kind of like Elliot, but I'm not talking about him. But, um, <laughs> but, I and I think I think Elliot has some good materialist credentials too. But, um, you know, uh, I and I don't think Elliot Elliot has his own projects, and I don't think he ever claimed to be like first and foremost a Marxist necessarily. You know, um. But but this is more directed at those who identify that way. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like somebody might have other views. I mean, I'm not going to say like if you're if you're like I'm a Catholic, I'm not here talking to you, right? Um, mm -hmm. But if you are a Marxist, you know, this is kind of what I kind of like because I posted the link up to the uh, the school of um, materialist research. I think with with yeah, um, it's with Paul Cockshaw and Katerina Kolzova mm -hmm. and people like this. And what I like about these guys is what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to I can't say like everyone, but what some of them are trying to do is they're trying to push it. Uh, they're trying to push away from some of the Hegelian idealisms. That have been, you know, and I look, I, I, I just recommended a book on the dealt with the rational kernel of Hegel here. So you can't say I'm an anti-Hegelian, right? But it's about the way you're approaching this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I, again, I don't agree with everything in the way they approach it, but I know, like, I know Katarina has been like, you know, there is no like Geist, you know, there is these these ideal concepts. We have to transpose them into a material and analytic. Um, I know that uh, Paul Cockshot has been a very, very uh, strong defender. Um, that the labor of theory of value can be used to predict prices, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I think it's it's interesting to try to approach it this way. Um, so, um, you know, but but regardless of, again, these are all controversial issues. These are all like Marxological controversy, but I like the general idea of pushing back against, against the liberal revisionism, you know, against the embrace of, you know, um, naive kind of identitarian positions, um, against the unfettered embrace of Hegelianized Marx. I like that and I think it's important. Um, so I think we have to be very, very, uh, cautious about that. And I think we have to be cautious about just, you know, and Zizek is partly mm -hmm. guilty of probably <laughs> the standpoint as well, but, but yeah. I think, I think we have to be Get careful. Him. I think we, yeah, well, I think we have to be careful about just, um, you know, I mean, I have, you know, I have, uh, I could say maybe in some sense, I have a Hegelian influence position. Um, but I do think there are certain distinct and salient aspects of Marxism that make it, you know, again, as Sartre has said, the truth of our time. In a fundamental sense, and I don't think you can jettison those, and and I think it's very dangerous to move towards uh, an analysis that is that is overall too Hegelianized, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we need we need a we need principles of material determination. I mean, I like what Althusser said. I put it up, right? You know, um, we know that uh, you know we know that that uh, consciousness is second secondary, even when it thinks it's derivatory status, 
right? Um, and that's a mistake people make too, right? They think like, oh, you know, and this is a philosophical mistake, right? People think like, oh, they're like, oh, well, I the first thing I experience is, you know, consciousness, right? Therefore, right? Consciousness is like the first flaw, the basis of the first philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, um, it's like when we talk about material determination, right? The fact of consciousness being the instrument through which you realize these things, right? Doesn't mean that it's that it's what determines in the last instance is alpha zero. Mm -hmm. Right? No, it's just an impression. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and you, you have to take it seriously, right? Because it, it plays a significant mediating role. I mean, that's the importance of ideology, right? Yeah, um, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't say the basis is consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Then you're, get, then you're getting that mixed up and then you're not going to be a Marxist if you don't mm -hmm. do that. And that's a, then we have a problem, right? Because that's our job. Right, mm -hmm. is to make sure that, that we that we don't have too many fucking deviations, right? And that's what we got to do. Um, just enough. Yeah, just just enough. Yeah, well, it's important to have have little deviations. Mm -hmm. um, and I could list all the deviations we've had so far, right? We've had uh, we've had what we've had the right. We had the, the right wing deviation uh, early on, which you had uh, you had the Elliot Terror, right? When you got rid of everyone, <laughs> when you cleaned up early on. That's it. Yeah, which, yeah. Without, without, without which I think the group would probably never have functioned. Um, mm -hmm. Then you you have uh, what what other ones do you have? You had the uh, yeah you had the you had the the sort of anarchist deviation with Jake Ballone, Theodore Ruskin, um, who mm -hmm. by the way is in London as well. Like everyone's in London. Okay. That guy Theodore I'm Ruskin sorry, is yeah. in London. That's not his real name. His real name's is... okay. Well, I won't go on. Yeah. Um, the uh, then you had sort of the um, uh, what is it? You had like the the PEMU, like the eclecticist populist reactionary cabal. Right, you see that thing that was posted from Pamu today? Like, why does Marx use bourgeois and proletariat for just rich and poor? This, I oh my god, oh my is this, god, is this Maoism? Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, Justin Murphy deviation, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, that's part of the, the Pamu deviation. deviation, yeah. The Pamu deviation is part of it, yeah, that's all connected. Like, I consider the Pamu yeah. stuff like an outgrowth of that. Yeah, um, it's, I think it's a bridge between the Elliot right wing deviation, the deviationists, and the Pamu, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and then you have the, uh, then, then more recently you've had the, I think in the past few days, we've seen some, um, I don't want to use any specific adjectives, but, but maybe, uh, misinterpretations with respect to the issue of, of trans rights, which, you know, certainly I think it's funny when people talk about this, like, this is just a liberal thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, he's like, yeah, Mariela Castro, such a liberal, right. You know, again, like you see, uh, Marxist Leninist parties all over the world, uh, you know, taking, uh, more progressive stances on this issue, these issues, mm -hmm. right? You know, in Corral, yeah. right? you know, the, the Indian Maoists have taken um, a progressive, relatively progressive position on these issues. So, so I think, I think it would be a terrible discredit to ourselves, right? You know, this is what, this is, I think this is the worst thing to me when people are like, you know, yeah, like, you know, uh, Marxism in the 20th century is like socially conservative ergo. And it's like, is that, a, like, that's a very dubious premise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's a very very dubious premise like mm -hmm. like i'm not saying that they weren't you know um for reasons better or worse i'm not saying that they, there wasn't certain conservatisms which were inflected in their positions right um but i think you know marxist regimes more so than than a lot of liberal regimes were very very progressive on different social issues right um you know and we know when we talk about you know international women's day this is working women's day right this is where this comes from right yeah. um you know, um, what's that book, right? And the, the guy, New York Times journalist, why women had better sex in East Germany, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we can go on, right? In terms of, you know, um, uh, you know, women in the workplace, right? Social rights and all these things, um, you know, daycare on and on and on. Um, but uh, the point is, I, I think it's already uh, to, it's already discrediting toward our own tradition to approach it from that standpoint. To say, oh, social progress, that's, you know, like progress when it comes to questions of minorities, that's a liberal position it right? is you know like to say that it's like 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 do you really want to cede that to those guys you know like you know in the united states they, they you know they they initially thought sinatra was a marxist right you know it's true uh in the house of un-american activities committees because in mm -hmm. advocating for black civil rights he and in, invariably ended up connected with marxist organizations who are the strongest advocates of that right? right so that's what i'm saying like you know it's just it's it's insulting and derogatory Towards their own tradition, to talk like, oh, that's all social conservatism. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not. No, we have to. We have to appropriate it, and we have to, you know, recognize it. Well, I, I, I don't even think appropriate is the right word because I think. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No. I, I think these things are organic to our own history, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
you know, I think the problem is like people take something which is fine, which is like Zizek's critique of political correctness. Okay, like po po political correctness can perpetuate, um, you know, a, a status quo, which is unconstructive, right? It can legitimize, you know, overarching power relations and so on. Um, but, you know, to say that that's bad, it's like, then you, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't kind of go to the extreme and just be like, I'm going to be transphobic. You know, that would be a stupid way of understanding that position. And this is but this is yeah. part of the problem. With, and this is connected with the PAMU deviation as well. Right. Mm -hmm. you yes. know, it's like the way that the the left critique of, you know, kind of SJW, woke culture, you know, political correctness, whatever. Um, the way that that, uh, you know, guides people towards the sort of edge lordism, right, where they're motivated more by this desire to offend liberals than to take mm -hmm. a principled position on these issues. Right. You know, I don't worry about that because I, I don't have a difficulty offending liberals. You know, I don't have to struggle yeah. for that, you know. Um, but what I'm saying, guys, is, uh, you know, read, go fucking read some Lenin, read some Marx, read some Althusser, you know, stop. You know, don't don't make your it's it's cool to offend liberals, but don't make that your, you know, your sole agenda. Don't don't define your character, you know, based on your capacity to offend liberals on the Internet, because that that that's going to that's going to potentially lead you in some um damaging directions and by the way i want to add when it comes to left, mm -hmm. left people who are formerly left who have really swung around and begun to align themselves with the alt-right on these issues um mm -hmm. they're always basically people who i think lacked a certain sincerity of commitment in their approach to the left and at some point they figured out that they'd be more you know that that it would be more efficient in terms of attracting attention to themselves or kind of exhibiting themselves to you know become racist or whatever right you know i mean mm -hmm. how fucking stupid is this Right. You know, yeah. it's incredibly it's incredibly uh, uh, it's incredibly infantile. Right. To make your to stake out your politics on that basis. So, um, again, right. It's 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 like I said, avoid avoid what I would call the socially conservative deviation. Right. I would avoid that. Mm -hmm. um, again, critique, critique, political correctness, uphold anti-racism and anti-sexism and, um, you know, anti. I don't know. How would you say this? Opposite, you know, and, and criticize opposition to trends, right? As well, you, know? through, you through can do principles. all those things. Yeah, yeah, you can do all those things, right? You can do all that. You can, you just because you criticize political correctness doesn't mean you have to be a racist. I, I'm, yeah, it's frustrating. I have to sit here and explain this to people. Yeah, people think cl political correctness is a thing of the left wing, and it's not. Yeah, that's not, that's not a real left wing thing, right? But anti racism is a real left wing thing. You see? Yeah, anti sexism that is a real left wing thing. And that's why I said, um, you know, that's why I said, uh, uh, you know, keep up, keep up the struggle uh, for feminism um, and, and against religion, right? That's why I said that. Mm -hmm. But, but I also, I said it because, um, you know, someone said, well, you know, there's some, I think there's like some macho elements in this group and I wouldn't disagree. Um, but I think, you know, all I said about this is that I think that, um, you know, it's a difficult actual question because we have, we have, as far as I can tell, we have a relatively, given that's an English group, large number of, of uh, trans women, in our group, as well as, um, you know, I think uh, sort of female Marxists from the global, who come from the global South or, or less developed countries. Um, I think the real underrepresentation, which is quite decisive in the overall scheme, um, is, you know, kind of like English speaking um, women from developed countries, right? Cis women from developed countries, basically, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's sort of the, the lack. Um, and well, I think we could all kind of do better in this respect. I also think that one has to, uh, and we don't really have time to delve too deep into this today, but I think that one also has to understand that this relates to certain um, negative tendencies which are inherent to what I would characterize as sort of liberal feminism in the West and the way that it functions and the appeal that it exercises over people from a certain kind of uh, socioeconomic background, especially perhaps Caucasian people. Um, so, you know, that's, that's, I don't think, I guess what I'm saying is some of this is beyond our remit. Right. We've, we've taken very progressive positions, I think, on all these issues. We've talked about wages for housework, things like that. Um, you know, just because there's not as many people like that in our group doesn't mean we, we don't support those positions. Right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's like I said, like Sanders was better on black questions than Biden. Black voters went for Biden. I mean, you don't always get a constituency just because your policies are more progressive. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we could all work to make the environment a bit more hospitable. Um, but I also said there are underlying complexities, not all of which are we can control easily. That, that dictate these things so you know but i do you know again uh, as for this i do see a lot of trans people i do see people like uh, mari who's from serbia originally inez from from tunisia 
um, Lucia, right, from Mexico and 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 other people. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really happy to see the the, the number of um, trans uh, trans women in our group too. It's 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 really cool. I it's so many. I I start to think. I think we're like I think we're like fulfilling a niche. My theory is that I think like I think transphobia is really rampant in like ML groups. This is kind of my theory. So I think people just get yeah. driven here because it's like the only place that kind of upholds a mass line. Um, well, they're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm proud. Of, I'm proud that if nothing else, you know, I don't know if this is what, if you asked me when I was 12, I don't know if this is what I would have told you I wanted to do, but, but I think, uh, to be able to build a sort of, uh, uh, you know, site for Marxist conversation online that people feel comfortable with, you know, from that demographic, that's, uh, that's cool. Right? Mm -hmm. So it works out. Yeah. So I just want to clarify these issues because I know there's been a little bit of, uh, a little bit of controversy, uh, lately, I guess it just surprised me how much, it always surprises me sometimes how much opposition um, there is to these things. Um, you it's know, good yeah, it's good. It's good. Sometimes I think it does. Uh, sometimes I think it's unproductive, but I think I think it can be productive. So uh, it's just about getting that right balance. Anyway, mm -hmm. we're at two hours, so now we've I went on for about you know twenty minutes of a group uh, stuff. Anything you want to say, Ernesto? No, I'm good for wrapping up. Okay. Well, let me give you the readings. Uh, I yeah. Give you the readings for next week. Uh, so next week, we are going to have um, Let Us Put the Past Behind Us and Open Up a New Era from 1989. Which is about the... Okay, we're going to 89 already, okay. Yeah, right. ending the Sino-Soviet split. The second one is Address to Officers at the Rank of General and Above in Command of the Troops Enforcing Martial Law in Beijing from June 19th, 1989. Yeah. I think you know what that's yeah. about. Yeah, yep. Uh, uh, and the about third time. one. the third one is... Excerpts from talks given in Wuchang, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Shanghai from uh, January. It, this is actually uh, excerpts from a bunch of talks from January 18th to February 21st, 1992. So that's the Southern Tour, famous Southern Tour. Uh, what's the last one? Uh, the last one is um, excerpts from talks given in Wuchang, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, and Shanghai. Yeah. I'll find it, but you know. Excerpts. Well, I'll put it. I'll put it all up like tonight or tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, gonna... I'm just highlighting them so I don't miss out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here we go. Got them. Got them. Don't worry. Perfect. All right. Okay. Cool. Um. So cool. Thanks, Ernesto. And uh, next week we should mm -hmm. have Timothy back for the yeah. finale. Uh, coasting back in here like a uh, Scully after a pregnancy in the X Files. <laughs> um. And uh, then we'll we'll wrap up. Uh, we'll wrap up Dang with a climax. And after that, we're going to move into five weeks of Xi Jinping. And uh, that will be it. And then we'll be done. Yeah. It's crazy. We're almost almost near the end now. We're two thirds through now. Uh, so thank and, and thanks so much for your dedication, Ernesto. I'm very, very good. Yeah, thank you, Conrad, for helping us. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, guys. Uh, uh, you know, uh, deviate well. You know, no more egregious deviations, hopefully constructive deviations uh, going <laughs> forward. Uh, and this yeah. has been... Uh, Chinese Marxism number 12. We'll see you guys at Chinese Marxism number 13. Have a good evening. Bye.